Hey guys. Part 3 of What If Naruto Discovers a Crash Starship and Trained Under the Sith Lord's Spirit. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 7 To say that Kabuto was nervous was an understatement. He had just learned of his teammate's death, and while he didn't care that Tsuruji Misumi was dead he did wonder why and by whom. Kabuto had been a spy for Sasori and picked to spy on Orochimaru as well as Kanahigakur. The snake Sini noticed the seal in Kabuto's head and removed it very early on. For that and many other reasons, Kabuto had faithfully served Orochimaru and had great respect for the Sini. With his adopted father being such an influential person at the hospital and Kabuto himself being a practicing but low-level medical nin, he had access to areas of the hospital which included the morgue. Kabuto had spent several hours thoroughly examining Misumi's body for evidence and to hopefully determine how and why his teammate was killed. As a spy, he was always worried about being found out. However, he was good enough to fool his father, his jonin sensei, the Hokage, and even the entire village. The only one he hadn't been able to fool was Orochimaru. This murder concerned him as he needed to find out if there was a chance that his secret had been discovered by someone. Even if it was a small chance he desperately needed to be certain that no one knew about him. Musumi's only wound aroused Kabuto's curiosity, as if he didn't know any better, he would have thought it was created by his master's Kuzanagi blade. The cut was incredibly clean and left little damage to the surrounding tissue. Kabuto also examined Misumi's head. Even if the body was dead, a cacophony of information could still be learned by a skilled medical nin, or even a hunter nin. Kabuto could have learned what Jutsu Musumi liked to use, what his elemental affinity was, if he had more than one affinity, and even what weapons Musumi liked to use. It was all there in the muscles, tissue, skin, and chakra pathways. A person just needed to be skilled enough to determine and recognize it and Kabuto was just that skilled. It was when he examined the head that Kabuto found something that he didn't expect. From what he could tell, it appeared as though the memory area of Musumi's brain had been accessed or damaged in some way. There was no physical damage, but he could tell that something was off about it. Could someone have accessed his mind? What would they have been after in the first place? Was he in danger of being discovered? Did someone already know about him being a spy? were some of the thoughts that went through his head as he analyzed the situation. He would need to prepare for any outcome, and would need to remain calm. The one thing that he couldn't figure out was who had done something like this. As far as Kabuto was concerned, Musumi was an idiot that would never achieve the rank of Chunin. Who would want to kill Musumi and who would want to go through his mind? He has nothing of value, thought Kabuto as he tried to come up with answers. It didn't really make any sense. Musumi was just a genin and wouldn't know any secrets about the village or about anything useful in general. The only thing that he would know about was his genin team being spies for Orochimaru. Paranoia was already starting to set in and Kabuto knew he would have to start double-checking to make sure he wasn't being followed or watched. The only thing that Kabuto knew for certain was that whoever had done it, they weren't under orders from the Hokage as the Sandane would never murder a genin. If the Sandane knew Musumi was a spy then he would have been captured and interrogated and not killed. He also knew that his still-living teammate, Akato Yoroi, wasn't responsible. That led Kabuto to thinking that it may have been someone that didn't take orders from the Hokage. He thought perhaps it could have been Shimura Danzo or one of his foundation ninja that he still had. Despite being told by the Hokage to stop all covert operations and disband his root ANBU, Danzo hadn't done anything of the sort. He had just gotten better at hiding the evidence of his actions from the village and Hokage. His foundation had been responsible for numerous assassinations and missions outside of the village. Orochimaru had even helped Danzo implant cells of the Shodai into an arm after he had left the village. Kabuto knew about this because he had helped his master work with the Shodai cells. Would Danzo try to get more information on Orochimaru-sama by targeting his spies in the village? thought Kabuto as he adjusted his glasses again, and he wasn't sure about the answer. 
He didn't know how Danzo would have found out about one of Orochimaru's spies in the first place. It was a mystery, and he didn't have enough evidence to make any conclusions. For now, he wouldn't do anything except keep observing, continue his work for Orochimaru, and watch his back. Sandame's Office The Sandame sighed as he looked over the class list of the recently graduated academy students. He was having a hard time fitting Naruto into a group. The boy could fit with several groups, and yet he felt they probably wouldn't work out. Naruto hadn't been the rookie of the year because he had been struggling with the clone jutsu despite having nearly perfect grades in every other subject and even performed the other academy jutsu perfectly. His grades had dropped just enough though to keep him out of the first spot in the class. The Sandame always stuck to tradition and put the top student along with the smartest kunoichi and the lowest student on a single team. That had been his team when he taught the Sandin but Naruto wouldn't be in that team and had to be placed elsewhere. The other problem with the teams was that they had one extra student because Naruto had skipped grades the previous year. This left an odd person out. The sand name was about to look through the list again when he remembered that there was an opening on an active genin team. The sand name didn't have any waiting genins to replace the missing member of that team but he could put an academy student for that position. While Naruto's grades may have dropped a little, he was still a very gifted student. The genin team in questions was really just a support team. They had been genin for a while but didn't go on very difficult or highly ranked missions. They had also failed to make it past the second stage of any chunin exam that they had taken. It was probably a very good team for a student that was skipped ahead several grades and that was difficult to place on any new genin squad. The Sandame looked over the skills of the remaining genin on the squad. Both were over five years older than Naruto, but they didn't seem to be going anywhere in terms of rank or development of new skills. Yakushi Kabuto seemed to have average or slightly above average medical training however if he wanted to be on the medical nin squad then he would have to at least be chunin rank. Akato Yoro only seemed to have a single jutsu that he relied on which was the ability to drain someone's chakra on contact. It wasn't the first time the Sandame had seen an ability like that but Yoroi hadn't progressed beyond that skill or learn any other techniques in order to become stronger. Because of this, the young man would most likely never achieve the rank of Chunin. It might be a good team for an academy student with no friends in his graduating class. They won't have very difficult missions and they don't try for the Chunin exams every year so Naruto will have plenty of time to get adjusted to a new team before even thinking about taking the exam, thought the Sandame. The Jonin also fits as I know him to be a very level-headed person who won't judge Naruto because of his burden and would probably be better than many of the other Jonin testing academy students this year. Naruto sat in the academy while the instructor gave his final lecture and congratulations to the students for passing the exam and moving on to Jonin. Naruto tuned the man out though as he started thinking about short-term goals of himself as well as his master. He had obtained several jutsu from the aim ninja but found out that genjutsu really wasn't something he was good at. Most of the problem was his chakra control and not his aptitude. He had been interested in genjutsu in the academy but would have to work on his chakra control before he would be able to look into it again. Naruto had also tried to find a way to create genjutsu with the force as his master told him it was possible but that he wasn't getting very far on his own developing force illusions. Mizuki was an interest to his master, and finding out what the man knew about the snake Sanin was a priority, but would wait for now. He couldn't go leaving another ninja of the village without any memory so soon after killing a genin, however he wasn't sure anyone would be able to link those together. The village would likely be on higher alert for a short period after the assassination so he would have to wait for a little while before considering anything. He also had to keep his sword from being noticed as anything more than a normal ninjato which was difficult to do with the color of the blade. It may not have been such a good idea to kill that genin with my sword or let it be seen by the weapon store owner and his daughter, thought Naruto as he hadn't really thought about that at the time. He was more concerned with other matters and not thinking ahead or considering the effects of his actions. Playguys had commented on the lack of secretiveness when evaluating his test and told him to have more tact in the future. Now he was left with a slight problem. He doubted that anyone would be able to figure out that it had been his blade that had done the deed but it did have a sharp edge, even without the vibrations, that it could easily draw attention to it. 
Perhaps I should use my regular ninjato that I used to practice with. At least for a little while, and then switch back, thought Naruto. He wouldn't need it for a while because he would most likely be doing D-rank missions in the near future. Recently he had heard a few students talking about a blade that he had created at a local weapons shop but it was still just rumor among academy students and he hadn't heard any of the villagers or ninja talking about it. It was a risk though as the shop owner's daughter was in the academy and did like to talk about weapons but no one knew much beyond the fact that it looked unique. It was when people saw him using it or started to question its qualities that he would become nervous. Naruto came out of his thoughts as the Chunin teacher finished his speech and started going through the Genin teams. Naruto listened for his name, but he hadn't heard it. It wasn't until the very end of the list that his name was spoken, Uzumaki Naruto. You will be placed on an existing Genin team, Team Shinjiro. With that said, the Genin were left to sit and wait for their new Jonin sensei to collect them. Naruto could hardly keep the smile off his mostly hidden face. He had been placed on the team that he wanted. While he kept up the smile and waited to be taken to his new team, a part of him was relieved. Killing the genin hadn't been for nothing and everything had worked out how his master had planned it, despite inadvertently discovered a genin team of spies working for a missing nin. The man Naruto had been waiting for entered and he waited to be called before he got up to go with his new squad captain and sensei. Uzumaki Naruto the man stated and Naruto got up to follow. He made sure he didn't instinctively get up to go with the jonin whose face he had memorized, as that would have raised questions as to how he even knew who the man was. It must be a little problematic to be placed on a team you've never met before. I suppose you would have rather been on a team with your friends, said Toshihiko Shinjiro, Naruto's new sensei. I don't have any friends stated Naruto as they continued to walk to meet the other team members at their usual meeting spot. I suppose that makes sense. Shinjiro thought. He's been moved through the academy and skipped ahead so he probably wasn't able to make many friends in his classes. Hopefully he'll be able to fit in with Kabuto and Yoroi. Getting over the loss of a teammate was never easy and replacing that teammate would be difficult on the rest of the team as well as the replacement. Shinjiro wanted to make the transition to a new team member as easy as possible for his team while working Naruto into the team dynamics. Naruto's file didn't tell him that much about where the boy's skills might be but he could tell that Naruto was at least decent in ninjutsu and above the rest of his older classmates in taijutsu. He would need to find out everything that Naruto could do so he could work on formations and strategies for the team. First, however, Naruto would need to meet the rest of the team. I can't believe you talked me into this again stated Niji as he walked the streets with his classmate Tenten. It didn't take that much convincing, this time or the first time. Tenten replied with a slight smile and Niji frowned at the answer as it was correct. This was the second time that the duo conducted activities related to Uzumaki Naruto. The first time was a few days earlier in order to find out where the boy lived and other information about his habits. Both academy students were interested in Naruto for different reasons though. Tenten was only concerned with the sword and scoffed at Niji's accusations that she was being obsessive about it. Ever since the afternoon that a boy had come into her family's store and created such a unique and amazing sword, she had focused on learning more. It should not have been possible for the boy to create such a weapon in that amount of time. She had been learning to wield and create weapons for years and she knew it wasn't possible for her to create something as amazing as the boy had. She also knew that even her father couldn't have created something like it. Once she had seen the sword, she knew that it stood apart from all other swords that she had ever seen before. This left a plethora of questions that she wanted answered. How did a novice at sword making create such a weapon? What was the sword made from, as the metal had a distinct color that was different than anything she had ever seen? Where did he learn to create swords? What process did he use and what tools were used? The sheer number of questions that she wanted answered had been bugging her since she had first seen the sword. She wanted to know and it was important to her. If her family could make more of those weapons then they would get a lot more business, and she also wanted her own unique sword. She would settle for him making her a sword if she couldn't get him to teach her how to make one. Unfortunately, while Tenten was not a shy girl and spoke her mind, she didn't know how to approach the boy and get what she wanted. 
He was always the odd person in the class and didn't speak to anyone except questions for the teacher to answer. Naruto mostly ignored everyone else around him. After leaving her grade she had trouble finding him as he disappeared right after class was over and arrived at the academy without anyone noticing. It was also Tenten's experience that techniques for making swords weren't shared with anyone else besides an apprentice or family, so it was unlikely that he would answer most of her questions. The curiosity about the sword itself had been reaching a boiling point in her, and she just wanted to see it again. She wanted to inspect it and touch it. Tenten wanted to learn all she could from it. The image of the blade laying on the counter in her family's shop had been imprinted on her mind since he had showed them the blade to get the right size sheath for it. It wasn't just that she wanted to see it, she had to see it again. The strangest part was that Naruto didn't wear the sword and she hadn't seen it at all since he first created it. It was never with him when she did see him which meant that he must leave it at home, and that was where Niji came in. Trying to follow the boy home hadn't produced any results, as he seemed to know that he was being followed, or just always made sure he wasn't tailed. She needed to find where the sword was while making sure she wasn't caught, and Niji's dojitsu would enable that. Niji however wasn't interested in the sword or Naruto either, at least he wouldn't admit to it, he just wanted answers to the questions that had been plaguing him. Niji had grown up and developed specific beliefs but Uzumaki Naruto was an anomaly, and countered those beliefs. Fate decided everything in Niji's opinion, and no one could escape that. Uzumaki Naruto was an orphan and didn't belong to any clan. The boy was poor and lived on his own in a dilapidated apartment. With no clan and no one to help him, the boy should have been at the bottom of the class or no better than average in the academy. He shouldn't have gotten any training or help and his fate should have been mediocrity in the academy. His grades and skills should have been among those of the civilian children, and yet those things were not true. Uzumaki Naruto was skipped ahead three grades, surpassing the children of all the clan heads in the village. Several of the students and even a few teachers considered him a prodigy, and perhaps the best of his generation. Now the boy had just graduated at the age of nine from the ninja academy. None of it made any sense to Niji. Niji was considered a genius and the best yoga to come in several generations. He excelled at Jukin and the gentle fist style which was acknowledged by everyone in his clan, main house or branch house. Fate had determined that, and it was Niji's fate to succeed at the academy and in his ninja career. It was therefore difficult for him to understand how Uzumaki Naruto was performing above everyone else when he clearly shouldn't be. The only explanation for this was that somehow Naruto was cheating or being helped. It was frowned upon for any ninja of the village to help or provide lessons to an academy student if they weren't a teacher at the academy. Someone must be helping him and Niji wasn't about to sit idly by while this happened. Fate could not be changed and Naruto's fate was obvious to him. Niji agreed to go along with Tenten in order to discover what was really going on, and then he would expose it and put Naruto back in his place. No one can escape their destiny, and Niji would make sure of that. While both had followed Naruto before, they weren't following him this time. Niji had used his Byakugan to make sure that Naruto wasn't near his apartment as Tenten was dead set on seeing the sword again and touching it. Niji was more interesting in searching for evidence and closely examining the apartment to find out what was really going on. They would have to sneak into the apartment to get to it, and while it was illegal, they both determined that they had sufficient reasons to do it. They knew that Naruto had been placed on a genin team and would be away from his apartment for a while which would give them some time to get inside and look around. Naruto sat at a training ground on a log as the other members of his new team introduced themselves. He was listening to what they were saying but also analyzing them and reviewing what else he knew about them. He idly wondered if either of them knew about the QB which was an interesting thought. They wouldn't have even been out of the academy when the village was attacked and the QB was sealed so they may or may not have been privy to that information. Akato Yoroi had just finished telling Naruto about his dreams for the future, and Kabuto's introduction was next. The white-haired genin first adjusted his glasses while giving Naruto a small smile before he started. My name is Yukushi Kabuto, but the remainder of Kabuto's speech was lost when Naruto felt something. It took a second to identify what it was when he realized that the security seals on his apartment had gone off. Who would break into my apartment? He thought as he continued to partially listen to Kabuto's introduction. 
He wasn't going to interrupt as there was nothing important inside his apartment that wasn't well hidden. If the other seals went off on one of his hiding spots inside the apartment, then he would be concerned. Naruto's eyes widened and his hear beat quickened as a moment later the seals on his main hiding spot activated. How the hell did they find it so quickly? He questioned as it was a village full of ninja but he was sure that his hiding spots would fool anyone who wasn't specifically looking for a hidden area. At this point Naruto was starting to have trouble sitting still as Kabuto finished his introduction. Who the hell is in my apartment? He wanted to know and moment later he knew his answer. He was again taken by surprise when he had the sudden feeling that someone had taken his sword from the hiding spot and was holding it. Naruto also received a few images of who was holding his sword. I never knew I had this kind of connection with my sword. He thought as no one else had ever come into physical contact with the blade besides himself. He was broken from his thoughts to give his own introduction to his new teammates and decided to wait before getting back to his apartment. He knew who was there now and what they were doing. If they did steal from him, then he would know exactly where to go. He would delay for the team meeting to be over which shouldn't take that long and then would see what was going on. It's just as amazing as I remembered it. Tenten said contently with her eyes fixed to the sheathed ninjato. It's still in the sheath, and aren't you becoming a bit obsessed over it? Niji questions with a shake of his head. You're one to talk. How much time do you spend on your hair and looking at it in a mirror? Then again I suppose you would know all about obsession. Chided Tenten as she set the blade down on the table in the kitchen, and Niji merely frowned at her. Niji had easily found the secret compartment in the wall in the kitchen with his Byakugan though either had noticed the seals that they had tripped. While Tenten stared at the sword in awe, Niji continued to examine the apartment. There was a black cloak in the hiding place along with several scrolls. He remembered and went to the hiding place to examine them. He removed the cloak to get to the scrolls underneath. There were six of them, and they were all the same size and color. He tried to open them but was unable to as they were sealed shut, and he also couldn't look into them with his dojutsu to read what was inside. Putting them back where he found them, he noticed several other hiding places with his byakugan but nothing of note was there except money and a few more scrolls. The scrolls were rather suspicious as they were sealed shut with perhaps a blood seal which was advanced for any academy student or genin. What would be in the scrolls that he would need to seal them shut and then hide them? Questioned Niji as he continued to analyze the rest of the apartment which was rather standard. He found nothing else that was out of place or suspicious. Niji deactivated his Byakugan upon hearing the oohs and ahs of his fellow classmate as she removed the ninjato from the sheath. He moved over to the table to get a better look at the sword that had captivated the thoughts of his classmate for some time. It was rather unique, and he could see what had caught her interest as a weapons expert. Tenten removed the blade from the sheath and examined it in every way she could. It was exactly how she remembered it. The red blade with black edges and a black handle. She picked up the blade and examined the balance and weight. Oddly she thought it was rather heavy for a blade of its size but the balance was perfect. She then pulled out a small magnifying glass and examined every inch of the polished blade. Amazingly enough, it was perfect and didn't have a single fault or mark. That doesn't make any sense. Every blade has tool marks or some kind of imperfection. Noted Tenten curiously, and her findings made her wonder more and more about the process that was used to make it. She looked up and at Niji, then smiled. It was disconcerting for Niji, as he really didn't like the smile and apparently had good reason as a moment later Tenten plucked out one strand of his perfect hair. Niji flinched and gave a glare but was curious to see what she would do. Tenten used the hair to test the sharpness of the blade. She positioned the sword with the blade facing up and gently touched a part of the strand of hair against the blade. It effortlessly cut, and she was rather impressed. Although Niji was slightly put off by the display, it was his perfect hair after all. Tenten then decided to use the nail of her thumb to test the sharpness. Why if you just used my hair are you now using your thumbnail? Asked Niji. Using a hair isn't really a test of sharpness, replied Tenten. Then why did you pluck one out of my head and use? Asked Niji while narrowing his eyes. Tenten merely shrugged while smiling. I was presented with an opportunity and I took it. Turns out Hyuga hair is not better than everyone else's hair. 
The answer made Niji twitch with anger, as he had lost a perfectly good hair for nothing but he didn't comment further as Tenten started her real test. The nail of her thumb was easily cut. In fact if she hadn't been so cautious about it, she probably would be bleeding right now or would have taken a part of the tip of her thumb off. I've never seen a sword this sharp. How in the world did he sharpen it so finely into such a razor edge? I wonder how strong it is. She thought but was brought out of her thoughts by Niji who was still periodically activating his eyes and looking out for the apartment owner to come back. Ten Ten, he's coming back, stated Niji with his Byakugan active. Ten Ten's eyes widened and she rushed to put the blade back in the sheath, then put it back in the hiding place. She replaced the piece of wall that hid the secret compartment, and then both students got out of the apartment. They may not have known how to tree walk yet, but they could still jump and fall good distances without any harm. They stopped rushing when they were a good distance away from the apartment. They both looked at each other, and Niji was the first to speak. Did you put sword back right where you found it? Yes, I put it back on the black cloak where it was when we opened the hidden compartment, replied Ten Ten with a sigh. The last thing either wanted was to be caught. Niji nodded and they started heading their separate ways. It wasn't until Niji was nearing the Hyuga compound that he had a thought. While the scrolls were suspicious, there was something else that he had overlooked until Ten Ten had mentioned it. I can understand that the scrolls were put in the hiding places to keep them from being found but why was there a black cloak? The cloak should have been in the closet. Why would someone want to hide a cloak? Unfortunately, he didn't have an answer. Naruto entered his apartment with caution. He knew that the girl from the weapon shop had been there, but as he got close enough to his apartment, he could feel that someone else was with her. It took only a few moments to identify the person from his memories of different people that he had come into contact with. It was a Hyuga boy from one of his previous classes. A branch member if he was not mistaken. He now knew why his hiding places had been discovered so easily as it was due to the dojutsu possessed by the Hyuga clan. Naruto was still paranoid so he first examined the entire apartment for traps before he started looking in all his hiding places to see if anything was taken. He sat down in a chair at his kitchen table and set his sword down on the table in front of him. Nothing had been taken but he could tell that the scrolls in his main hiding place had been looked at. He was fortunate that he had placed seals on them to keep them from being open, but he was unable to tell if one or both of the intruders had been interested in the scrolls. It wouldn't have been good to have academy students find copied water jutsu from the Naidem Hokage as he had copied the jutsu from the main scroll which was at the hideout inside the Hokage mountain with the Raijin. He used those scrolls to learn the jutsu from so that he was separated from the stolen scroll in case the hideout was ever found. Naruto had a hard time believing that Hyuga Niji would have agreed to help break into his apartment. He must have had some kind of reason or curiosity in order to come here and not only look through my entire apartment but act as a lookout, believed Naruto, and he wondered what those reasons were. He didn't take Niji as the kind of person who would help out another academy student. The Hyuga boy believed they were all beneath him. Looking at his sword, Naruto found himself experiencing many different feelings that he would normally have had tight control over he felt rather angry, frustrated, and even afraid. Searching his feelings he found that he was not angry about his apartment being broken into or his hiding places found. He was feeling these emotions because someone had done something to his property, his sword. It seemed that he had more of a bond and was more attached to the sword than even he was aware. It would explain the images that he saw of the girl examining his ninjato, and that he knew someone else was holding it. The real question was what would he do now? There was no way he was going to leave his sword in his apartment, or put it anywhere else. He knew that the girl, Ten Ten he believed her name was, had tried to follow him several times but apparently her interest in the blade was such that she was now bringing in a Hyuga to help her get access to it. Naruto had been wary of using his sword and wanted to use another for a period of time but now he was positive that he couldn't let his sword out of his sight or off his person. It was his sword and only he would use it and not some other person. His teammates already knew from his introduction that he was interested in Kenjutsu but he would have to hide its special properties from them. It might be difficult in the case of the ever-observant Kabuto but he didn't want to be parted from his weapon again. Playguys was silent as his student thought about his created weapon. 
He was interested to see that Naruto and the sword did share some type of bond and that the boy was rather possessive of it. Naruto didn't act like that with any other object so it must also be because of the forging process or rituals involved in the blade's creation. Feeling with the force, Playguys could already feel the sword taking on a slight aura of the dark side of the force. He was interested to see what would become of this. Stupid D-rank missions, thought Naruto angrily as his team was coming back to the Hokage Tower after spending a portion of the day weeding a garden. Naruto had learned how bad the missions were from draining mines but it was even worse when experiencing them firsthand. It had been several weeks since Naruto joined his new squad and since then they had done nothing but team training, formations, and crappy missions. It was mind-numbingly boring but the team actually managed to get along just fine. Naruto had never imagined himself getting along with any of his teammates no matter what team he was paired with, and it was ironic considering they were spies and he himself had committed numerous crimes against the village. They were all actually guilty of treason, though no one knew about it or had the evidence to convict them. From working on his team, Naruto had noticed several things about Jen in the in the village. There didn't seem to be many people that actually took Jenin seriously. Not the villagers and not even the other higher-ranking ninja of the village. It also seemed very dependent on age. Between the age of 13 to 16 was the range for Jenin that were more likely to be taken seriously. Kabuto was already at the end of the that range while Yoroi had passed it, and Naruto himself had yet to reach it. Jenin that were younger and older than the range were taken less seriously as younger Jenin were seen as being physically weaker and the older Jenin were seen as being not very competent because they weren't able to become progress and rank to Chunin. Naruto found it interesting that people didn't see his team as competent or powerful, especially when it came to Kabuto. The glasses wearing Jenin was nearing the higher limit on the age range, but no one seemed to take Kabuto seriously. From what Naruto knew from stolen memories, Kabuto was at least on the same level as their sensei, possibly stronger. Naruto wondered how a jonin sensei could not notice something out of the ordinary on his own team, but he supposed it was due to the whole team being spies and covering for each other. Naruto was beginning to see just how the team had managed to escape any notice for so many years. He was also starting to question whether he wanted to achieve a higher rank anymore. It was good to be underestimated and everyone seemed to do that for most jonin. Chunin Ninja were able to access the ninja library but given the lax security, he might be able to break into it and get anything he wanted. Chunin were also restricted out of certain sections of the library that only special jonin and higher ranks were allowed into view. Naruto didn't know how long it might take to reach the rank of Chunin or special jonin, so he would have to think about it. Playguys had little to say about the matter as he wanted his student to make these decisions and stated that while both choices would lead to different outcomes, in terms of rank and struggles for Naruto, they would achieve the same goals of learning more jutsu and techniques. Naruto would have to meditate on this decision in his free time. Several weeks had passed since the murder of a genin in the village. Over that time, no new information or even a suspect had been found. From stealthy excursions into the village during several times of the day, Naruto found that the security in the village had lessened back to where it had been several months before. Naruto took this as a sign to start tailing and observing Mizuki. The records of ninja were unfortunately held in Kanoha Ninja Library which Naruto didn't have access to but would one day get into, one way or another. He therefore didn't have much information on Mizuki. Naruto already knew that the Chunin was under investigation but no one was following him, or even keeping an eye on him. It seemed that the village wasn't very concerned with the suspicious actions of Mizuki, or they just didn't have the manpower to keep a close eye on him. Naruto was searching the man's apartment, while the Chunin was teaching at the academy but found nothing of interest. Like Rokusho Aoi, Mizuki tended to favor weapons over any jutsu or at least didn't have any scrolls of ninjutsu or genjutsu in his apartment. This led Naruto to wonder why Mizuki wasn't working on learning any techniques from the library or at least learning nature manipulation. It seemed now that Mizuki wouldn't try to learn any jutsu as Naruto had the strong feeling that the Chunin was obsessed with getting power and prestige in the village. Why wouldn't he start learning everything that he could with his access to the ninja library? What kind of person is obsessed with power, but won't take full advantage of what is available to him? Naruto questioned as he left Mizuki's apartment just the way he found it. 
It was Playguys that answered as he had seen this many times before. He is the kind of person who doesn't want to work for power or for prestige. He wants things given to him and everything to be easy. He won't work for power and is a narcissist so he believes he is better than everyone else and should be noticed above others. It's possible that he is interested in Orochimaru because of the man's power and prestige. He probably wants the same and was thinking about how to get it when you gleaned those thoughts from him. If he really is that interested in Orochimaru then he must have some information about him. Aoi and Misumi didn't have very much information and one of them was even a spy for the man. Mizuki is older than both and could have more knowledge that they know nothing about. Even if he doesn't know much, he could be used for other things. Suggested play guys but he didn't elaborate much and wanted Naruto to figure out what he might be implying. Naruto thought about what his master had said while walking away from Mizuki's apartment and making his way back to his own. He made sure no one had seen him as he ducked down the back alleyways of the village. What could Mizuki be used for? He's a teacher at the academy, but he doesn't have access to anything that I haven't already stolen from there. Let's see, he's Chunin in rank. And it was at that point that Naruto had realized what his sensei was thinking. Yumino Iroka walked to Mizuki's apartment and rang the bell. Mizuki walked to the door and looked through the peephole. His face darkened at the sight of his longtime friend and before he opened the door to see what Iroka wanted, he had to put on the facade that he had been using for years. What is he doing here? I see him enough at the academy as it is, thought Mizuki with some anger. Iroka, what are you doing here? Mizuki asked with a smile and as nice a tone as he could fake. I thought we could go over the class notes and homework, stated Iroka with a similarly fake smile and tone. We already went over them for the rest of the week, stated Mizuki as he was slightly puzzled. Iroka faltered for only a second before stating, I meant for next week. Mizuki twitched at this but didn't think it that odd. Iroka liked to keep up with all the classwork and often asked his opinion on what they were teaching the students. Mizuki didn't give a damn but had to keep up appearances so he invited Iroka inside his apartment. Iroka already knew where everything was and walked to the dining room table in the kitchen. Mizuki walked over and for a moment found it strange as they had sat in the living room area the last time Iroka had come over but didn't think much of it at the time. Iroka was about to open the scrolls that he brought with him, when he asked, Do you have any tea? And the question made Mizuki twitch again. Sure, I'll go get us some, said Mizuki in a sickly sweet voice. Iroka didn't unroll any of the scrolls but got up and walked towards Mizuki. What kind of tea do you have? Asked Iroka as his face darkened slightly, and he performed a single seal. You know perfectly W but Mizuki never got a chance to finish as Iroka's chakra glowing hand came into contact with his shoulder. Mizuki immediately felt his strength leave him and before he could attack or do much of anything, he had already slumped down to his knees. What the hell? He's draining my chakra? thought Mizuki as he looked up at the friend he always disliked and wondered why he was doing this. He tried to reach for a kunai or break contact with Iroka's hand but it was no use. His chakra reserves had always been low and it was one of the reasons why he hadn't spent much time learning ninjutsu. As more chakra left his body, his hand which had managed to reach a kunai loosened and the metal weapon fell to the floor. His vision was swimming and his body felt completely useless. Mizuki's eyes started to close and he completely collapsed to the ground unconscious. Iruka smiled slightly and was enveloped in smoke as the henge was released and revealed Naruto in his black cloak. Naruto knew better than to try mind tricks out on Kabuto but it turned out that Yoroi was rather susceptible to them, and it wasn't hard to trick him into giving Naruto his chakra draining technique. Naruto bargained for a low-level water jutsu just to make him think that it had been a fair trade. He also added the thought that it would be a good idea not to tell anyone about the exchange. The technique proved to be very useful and this was the first chance he had to test it against someone. Moving quickly, Naruto dragged Mizuki out of the kitchen and into the living room. He tied the man up and then placed his hand on the Chunin's head. Activating his drain knowledge technique, he started looking through the Chunin's mind for the information that he was after and anything else that might be useful. Naruto sifted through the memories to find many things that were strange to him. He found that Mizuki was jealous of Iruka ever since they were children. 
Mizuki was loved by a woman that Iruka had feelings for but he himself felt nothing for her and just used their relationship to hurt Iruka. During a mission, Mizuki had killed a teammate who was injured to not slow down the rest and complete the mission and that was the reason why he was being investigated. Right after that memory was when he found what he was after. Mizuki had actually encountered Orochimaru. They had talked and Orochimaru had given Mizuki something. It was a piece of paper with some kind of formula and picture on it that would apparently give him power. Once he found the memories of Orochimaru, he searched for anything else concerning the snake Sanin. It took a little bit of digging but he did find small bits of information. Mizuki had idolized Orochimaru and wanted as much power from the man as he could get. He was still working out what exactly the piece of paper that was given to him was in Naruto as well as play guys were rather interested in it. They also learned that Mizuki planned to take a scroll from the Hokage to give to Orochimaru for more power. The Chunin had yet to figure out how to take the scroll but he had been working on finding out where exactly it was in the Hokage Tower and how it was guarded. Beyond that, Mizuki had little information on Orochimaru. He barely knew why the snake Sanin had even left the village in the first place and even believed that the man had been wrongly accused and ostracized from the village. Both Naruto and Playguys were primarily interested in the piece of paper and the scroll of seals. Mizuki no longer had the sheet of paper which had a formula and picture on it but had gotten a tattoo placed on his arm that had all of the information, then he destroyed the paper. They also found out from Mizuki's mind that the scroll he thought about taking contained all of the forbidden jutsu in the village, and they now knew its existence, as well its general location but no information about what traps might be protecting it. Naruto had finished with his searching of Mizuki's mind and made sure to destroy all of the man's memories. He had only wanted to find out some information about Orochimaru but had gotten far more than he originally sought. He could tell that his master wanted the scroll and the information on the tattoo in addition to the other plans that they had. Naruto didn't stop to think very long though. He now had more things to accomplish in the same amount of time. He went to one of the scrolls that he had brought with him and copied down all the information he had just taken concerning the formula and the image that were on the paper Orochimaru had given Mizuki. He didn't know what it all meant and neither had Mizuki but it would be something to figure out in the future. After that was done, Naruto went back to his original plan. He picked up the scrolls and left he apartment. Mizuki would be unconscious for some time as he had a bad case of chakra depletion. Mizuki walked up the long staircase to the Kanoha Ninja Library. He showed his ninja identification to the guard at the door to the library and was allowed entrance into the building. The disguised Naruto was instantly aware of the cameras and even the ninja librarians that were looking at him. Mizuki may be under investigation, but he wasn't forbidden from being in the library and had access to it because of his rank. Unfortunately, since he wasn't a special jonin or jonin, he only had limited access to the resources present there. Both he and Playguys looked through the books and scrolls on the walls and ranked the ones that they each were more interested in. They had limited time and wouldn't be able to look at everything in the library. Mizuki would only be unconscious for a day or so, but since it was the weekend, no one would come looking for him. At least Naruto hoped that no one would. Mizuki didn't have many people that normally came to see him and aside from possibly Iruka, few people that he socialized with. With a short mental debate, both play guys and Naruto decided which information would be the most helpful to copy down and learn in the time that they had. A moment later, Naruto started looking through the scrolls on nature chakra and manipulation. He quickly copied the information down onto the scrolls that he brought with him. They had agreed to look at all the jutsu they could but Playguys wanted to look more into the few jutsu area of the library which was untouched by nearly everyone that came into there. Naruto questioned the reasoning but said nothing to Playguys as his master knew what he was doing and Naruto trusted his judgment. The library also had information on the ninja of the village but they didn't want to draw too much attention so they stayed away from that section. Naruto spent several hours in the disguise of Mizuki and sitting at one of the tables in the library while copying down and memorizing the information that he read in the scrolls and books that he looked at. He also found what his master was looking for in the Fuinjutsu section which was seals concerning security. After Naruto's apartment had been broken into, Playguys decided that the hideout in the Hokage Mountain needed its security increase to prevent anyone from finding the stolen items that they had hidden there 
and from gaining any access to it at all. The Sith did have runes which were a part of Sith magic and consisted of a series of symbols that could be placed on surfaces to produce various effects of the Force. Playguys was interested in seeing what ninja Fuinjutsu could do compared to Sith runes. He had been rather interested after examining the storage seals and having his holocron sealed into one on his student's arm. From what Naruto found, Fuinjutsu was easier to apply as Sith runes had to be etched or carved into a surface whereas Fuinjutsu was a combination of ink and blood that could be applied much easier and faster. It seemed each style had its own advantages and disadvantages too. Fuinjutsu could be used for sealing an area and barriers whereas the Sith runes could be used to make people overlook or to better hide an area as well as protecting a surface from damage. Playguys believed that the best security that could be provided was a combination of both styles and he had waited on adding Sith runes to the hideout until he had learned all that Fuinjutsu was capable of. Sith runes were one of the reasons why Playguys' private quarters had survived the explosion of the reactor after his apprentice killed him so many years ago. Otherwise, his holocron and other items would have been destroyed in the explosion. Naruto had quite a bit of work to still finish as he left the ninja library when it closed later that afternoon. He still had to figure out how to take the scroll of seals without getting caught as he had less information about its location than he did when he took the Raijin and the scroll left by the Nighting. I have to memorize the patrols and figure out when it's best to infiltrate the Hokage Tower again, thought Naruto with a weary sigh as he had been looking through and copying scrolls and books for hours. He wasn't planning to infiltrate tonight as there were too many possibilities of making a mistake because he was so tired. Mizuki would only stay unconscious for less than a day so he would have to drain more of the Chunin's chakra in the morning to make sure that he didn't wake up. The Chunin was still part of the overall plan and needed him to remain in his apartment until everything was over. Later that night, the sky was dark and the stars were out but Naruto's attention was elsewhere. Sitting in a vantage point on a tree that was growing out of the side of the Hokage Monument, Naruto looked through his goggles and monitored the activity in and around the Hokage Monument, which included the Hokage Tower and adjacent buildings. His life-sensing ability had enough range that he could feel everyone inside the building from where he was and was watching for ninja patrols on the outside. He was still tired but was trying his best to focus on what was happening beneath him. Both master and student were very interested in finding out and learning what was in the scroll as even Mizuki didn't know anything that was in it, just what kind of techniques were supposedly in it. Kinjutsu were something that Playguys was very interested as they seemed to be the more dark side of chakra techniques, and he was interested to see what these techniques entailed and what they could do with them. While he would most likely never be able to use chakra, his student would be able to use the techniques on his behalf and for their benefit. Another patrol moved through the area and did a sweep of the outside of the building while the ninja inside the building walked around the halls. Naruto made another note of it and the time that it occurred. Kanoha ninja are rather punctual when it comes to patrolling but at the same time very predictable and complacent. Thought Naruto as he knew that even though he planned to steal the scroll the following night, the patrols would still follow the same schedule, possibly for the rest of the week. Besides watching for the patrols, Naruto also looked for any gaps where they patrolled and looked all over the outside of the buildings. If anything went wrong, he would know the best place to hide and make an escape. His mind wandered to the other tasks he had to do in the next week. Naruto planned to spend a good portion of the following week learning and adding all the seals he found in Sith runes to the hideout, and even some to his apartment. He had not underestimated the ninja of the village, but it seemed he had underestimated the curiosity of his former classmates. He now had to contend with the Byakugan which would be difficult as he couldn't feel that he was being watched by the Dojutsu. It was a problem that couldn't be completely solved. While looking through the Fuinjutsu in the library, Naruto did find a couple that could be used to hide an area from the Dojutsu but he couldn't hide himself if someone saw him going to his secret hiding places in his apartment or his hideout in the Hokage Mountain. I don't have anything that can fool those eyes from seeing me whenever they want, and I can't even tell I'm being watched, thought Naruto with a scowl as it could hinder his plans if he was caught, or even if someone saw him doing something illegal or suspicious. It all started with his sword and now he wanted to make sure that no one found anything else about him or his activities in the village. The following night, Naruto made his way to the Hokage Tower. 
He had spent the day planning everything out, and would have Mizuki take the majority of the blame for the theft just like Rokusho Aoi had. Mizuki had been drained of chakra again, not all of his chakra but enough to keep him unconscious for the rest of the day and most of the night. Naruto soundlessly slipped through the village and idly wondered how many more times he would have to do something like this. He was barely out the academy and was already regularly committing treason. He cared nothing for the village, at least he told himself that, but he couldn't help but wonder how long he could get away with this without someone starting to catch on or without making a mistake. It seemed that every time he had these activities, it led to something else being revealed or discovered in the village. Naruto had been spying on the Chunin examinees and found out about the Raijin and Naidame scroll, eliminating a genin to take his spot on a team lead to him learning about spies of Orochimaru in the village and a few of the snake senin's activities. And now while trying to find information about Orochimaru from Mizuki had lead to learning of the scroll of seals and the mysterious formula and image. This provided opportunities but also threatened to get him caught or discovered. When would he finally be able to let things calm down before he got caught? This isn't what I should be thinking about. Naruto chided himself as he focused back on the task at hand. I'll have to lay low for a long while after this and not do anything else inside the village. He thought as outside the village was a different matter entirely. Naruto eventually donned a henge of Mizuki and entered the Hokage Tower through one of the windows on the second floor of the building. He ended up in a records room. Closing his eyes, he felt for the life signatures of people in the building and found they were exactly where they had been the previous day. Glancing at his watch, he knew he had about ten minutes until another patrol came by and the guards inside the tower had a slightly different schedule. Moving stealthily down the halls, Naruto looked for any traps, cameras, and now that he knew what to look for, he also looked for few injets of security seals. From what Mizuki knew, the scroll of sealing was kept in a special area that ninja could only access with the Hokage's permission. The only person that Naruto really had to worry about was the Sandame, as he lived in the Hokage Tower and slept near the room Naruto was heading to. When he was stealing the Raijin, Naruto didn't worry that much as that sword had been kept on a different floor so it wasn't that much of an issue. Now however, he would be much closer to the Hokage than he planned on and it appeared that the Sandame was up late trying to finish his paperwork. That also hadn't been a problem the last time he was in the building but Naruto had also gotten better at suppressing his chakra and stealth in general. He was also under a henge and hiding his scent. He wasn't sure how well he could outrun Ninja if he was caught, but he did have a plan if anything went bad. Ascending a staircase and waiting for a Chunin guard to pass by, Naruto moved down a new hallway and arrived at the room he wanted. Checking as best as he could for Fuinjutsu, he didn't find anything and used the force to sense if the door was booby-trapped. It wasn't so he forced the lock and opened the door, quietly entered the room. Moving in the dark, Naruto looked through the room and cursed. This entire damn room's filled with scrolls, he thought, and it made him want to yell out in frustration. He had no idea what else was in the room, only the scroll of seals, and if he had known, he would have better prepared. Mizuki also didn't know what the scroll of seals looked like and it was the only one he was after. The only thing the Chunin did know was that it was a really large scroll. That information is no longer relevant, thought an agitated Naruto as he examined several shelves of big scrolls. None of them were even labeled. Angry and frustrated, Naruto started frantically searching for what he was after. He wanted a specific scroll and he wasn't about to start stuffing every scroll he could find into his pockets as he had no idea what was in them, and no time to find out. His pockets also weren't that big. Naruto ignored several shelves of smaller scrolls, which were within his reach, out of his mind and focused only on the big scrolls. He didn't know that the scroll of seals contained all of the forbidden jutsu of the village, so he partially opened and glanced at nearly every scroll on the shelves until he saw something that was promising. Shadow Clone Jutsu Birank Kenjutsu this jutsu is forbidden too. And he stopped reading that entry to look at the next one. The next jutsu was also labeled as a kinjutsu so he grabbed the scroll and rushed to the door of the room while he put the strap on the scroll over his shoulder. He never noticed that as soon as he took the large scroll off the shelf, a ceiling array was activated. Naruto exited the room and checked for life signs as he glanced at his watch. 
Shit, I took too long. And he stopped as he felt Ninja behind him and coming up the staircase ahead of him. Did I trip something? He thought before glancing back to see a frowning Hokage. Turning to the way he was heading before he stopped, Naruto saw two Chunin come out of the staircase door and two ANBU come running down the hall. Fuck. Time for the escape plan. Naruto thought that he ran forward at the four ninja ahead of him. There was no way he would charge the Hokage, and he watched as the ninja tensed and reached for weapons. Instead of fighting them though, Naruto smashed into a nearby door and forcibly entered the random room. He stopped as soon as he entered and started frantically making hand seals for a jutsu that he had only managed to practice on. His practice however was on a much smaller scale and in his bathroom tub. He could feel the ninja converging on the room while two of them ran to go outside the building to make sure he didn't jump out the window in the room and escape. It only took a few seconds but Naruto was stressed and it felt like his hand seals were taking forever. He finally completed the ninjutsu and said in Mizuki's voice water release, exploding water colliding wave and he spewed out water out of his mouth which filled the room. The ninja came to a halt at the door that the intruder ran into as water started rushing out the small gap in the bottom of the door. A moment later, the door burst open and a torrent of water flooded the hallway. The Sandaim felt the jutsu building up and had already gone through hand seals for an earth wall which he used to stop and deflect most of the water away from his ninja. The ANB that were outside would likely apprehend the intruder which the Sandaim recognized as a chunin named Mizuki. He only knew the man because of the recent suspicious circumstances on his recent mission and Ibiki was looking into him. The water destroyed a window of the Hokage Tower and gushed out of the tower while taking Naruto with it. Naruto went through more seals to create a water clone of Mizuki with the scroll strapped to his back but without a ninja vest. Naruto then reached into his ninja pouch to retrieve a scroll and unraveled it while he landed on the ground below. He released the contents to the water clone which caught the ninja vest and put it on while running towards the real Mizuki's apartment. The ANBU arrived a moment later to give chase to the clone and didn't see the disguised Naruto as he had already sunk into the standing water to hide himself. He would wait as he could feel many other ninja heading towards the Hokage Tower, and they would no doubt be sent to follow the intruder which would give him an opening to escape. The water clone ran through the village on an obstacle course for the two following ANBU. The water clone jutsu had a tenth of the original's chakra and had little intelligence but they could still move fast. The ANBU were starting to catch up but the clone moved through the village with ease while they were slowed down trying to apprehend it and retrieve the scroll without damaging it. By the time the clone made it to the apartment building and went through the front entrance, the ANB were nearly on top of it and had already thrown several projectiles to stop the thief. The clone made it up the staircase to Mizuki's apartment and ran inside the apartment while locking the door behind it. The clone then took off the vest, threw it on the bed in the bedroom and entered the connected bathroom. Not bothering to shut the door behind it, the clone stepped into the tub and ended the technique turning back into water which started flowing down the drain. A moment later, the ANBU broke into the apartment and found an unconscious Mizuki on the floor. They were stopped long enough by finding the thief that by the time they got to searching the bathroom of the apartment to look for the scroll, the tub was already empty. Hokage's office What do you mean you didn't find the scroll? demanded the Hokage to a group of his ANBU. It had only been half an hour since the theft, and now his ninja were telling him that despite apprehending the thief, they were unable to locate the stolen scroll. We chased Chunin Mizuki back to his apartment. We found him unconscious from chakra depletion but the scroll was gone. He didn't drop it on the way to the building because he had it while we were chasing him and we are searching the entire apartment building and surrounding area for anyone suspicious or anywhere that the scroll could be hidden. Replied Crow of the ANBU forces. I can't believe this thought a frustrated Sandaim as he rubbed the side of his face and forehead. Where is he now? demanded the Sandaim, and it was Crow that replied, we took him straight to interrogation. Was there evidence of anyone else being involved? inquired the Sandaim. The tracking teams didn't find any other sense at the tower or at the apartment, but they tracked Mizuki's trail from the tower to the apartment. We know he was the one who took the scroll, but we aren't sure if he was working with someone else or acted alone, answered Crow. The Sandame nodded at the answer and thought about the situation. 
A Chunin managed to get into the tower and take the forbidden scroll. He thought and then continued. He then used at least a B-ranked water jutsu to create a diversion to help him escape, but his file says that he doesn't know any water jutsu, have a water affinity, or know anything higher than low-ranked ninjutsu for that matter. So, he used most of his chakra to escape and managed to get back to his apartment before passing out from chakra exhaustion, but that doesn't explain where the scroll is. Perhaps Ibiki and Inoichi will have more luck, he thought with some hope. The theft of the scroll of sealing was no light matter as that scroll had incredibly powerful and contained the most dangerous jutsu of the village. He hoped that the interrogation department would find out why the Chunin did it and where the scroll was. It was likely that the Chunin was working with someone and the village was currently on lockdown to prevent anyone from entering or leaving. The Sandaim only had to wait 10 or 15 minutes before Inoichi entered the room to give his report. We weren't able to get anything from Chunin Mizuki, Sandame sama Enoichi stated with a small bit of shame in his voice but while keeping eye contact with the Sandame. Did he kill himself? Asked the Sandame as that was common for prisoners who might have information or don't want to go through torture and interrogation. No, Sandame sama He is perfectly healthy besides the chakra exhaustion but he has no memories. Stated Enoichi seriously and he knew the Sandame would get what he was telling him. So it's happened again. Something else was stolen, and we still don't have any leads on who is doing it, and another ninja of Kanoha either had some part in the theft or was framed, thought the Sandame, and heavily sighed after his ninja had left his office. How is it that someone can keep getting away with this in a village full of ninja? Naruto sat in his bed at his apartment and stared at the ceiling. He had already dropped the scroll off at the hideout, and was slowly calming down from the adrenaline that had been flowing through him from his activities earlier in the night. I was almost caught tonight, was the thought that kept going through his mind. He had made a plan just in case he was caught, and it had worked perfectly but that wasn't exactly the point. Naruto was more concerned that his luck was going to run out. It was true that both he and Playguys wanted the scroll and after removing Mizuki's memories it presented a perfect opportunity. He could possibly have waited or made a different plan but he pushed forward and that was what almost got him caught. Despite the situation being over, he still had many things to do and many different problems that he had to watch out for. The hideout needed to be secured and made nearly impenetrable from people and dojitsu. It would take some time to make sure that the area was safe as it now held three items that he had taken from the village and at any point... If a Hyuga used their dojitsu or a person went into the area behind the faces of the Hokages, they would find evidence of someone living there and the stolen items. Naruto was rather stressed out by that. He could technically be caught at any moment, and he already had several people following him on an unrelated matter but he had to make sure they didn't find anything that was incriminating. He knew that perhaps the girl's student could be bought off but he wasn't sure about the Hyuga. He had to make sure that he wasn't followed or if he was, that he didn't reveal the hideout or anything else that would raise questions. As it was, he was now looking forward to spending more time outside of the village on missions and less time near the items that he had stolen and inside the village that he disliked. Chapter 8 I spy with my little eye, something purple, stated Naruto with a hidden smile. It wouldn't happen to be myself or Yoroi-san again, would it Naruto-kun? stated Kabuto with a nervous chuckle while adjusting his glasses. Both he and Yoroi were the only ones wearing purple for at least a mile since they were on the road and heading back to the village from a mission. Wow, Kabuto-san. You're really good at this game, stated Naruto with fake awe. Well, I am rather observant, quipped Kabuto with a fake smile. This was by no means the first time that Naruto had insinuated or suggested in one way or another that Kabuto and Yoroi could be spies. It wasn't always subtle either. Like when Naruto found out about Kabuto's ninja info cards and suggested that some of the information on them might be classified and Kabuto probably shouldn't even know it, and that a spy for another village would really want to get his her hands on cards like that. It didn't really matter what Naruto said as their sensei still remained as clueless as ever concerning his genin. Kabuto, however, was well aware that Naruto knew something about him but was rather curious as Naruto had never openly admitted anything and never bothered to alert anyone that his teammates were spies. 
Kabuto found it strange and he would never openly admit that he was a spy nor had he tried to silence Naruto in any way. Kabuto also knew some things about Naruto and never admitted them either. It was an interesting stalemate and dynamic as either made any moves to admit what they knew and just continued the charade. Naruto was rather enjoying messing with his two teammates again. Neither could really do anything about it and didn't want to risk revealing anything. They were both still ranked as genin, while it had been a year since Naruto had been promoted to chunin at the chunin exams. Naruto tried to get the other members of his team promoted as well but Kabuto opted out after the second exam and Yoroi failed to be selected for chunin rank during the final stage of the exams. From what he could tell, Kabuto seemed to have another purpose for staying at genin, and he felt that it had to do with the ninja info cards and information that the silver-haired genin was constantly gathering. After much meditation, Naruto had decided that it would be worth it to strive for promotion instead of staying a genin. He had examined the reasons for both sides of the problem at length. The conclusion Naruto came to was that he had more reason to get a promoted to chunin than stay as a genin. Naruto found that it would likely look more suspicious if he, who had been rushed through the academy, had not been promoted to chunin in a short amount of time. People, especially the Hokage, might think it strange that such a promising academy student had been unable to reach Chunin a few years after becoming a genin. The other reason that he wanted to get promoted had to do with what he had found in the ninja library. Since raiding the archives in the guise of Mizuki, Naruto discovered how useful Fuinjutsu could be as well as the rest of the information in the library. After looking through the scrolls he copied and sifting through his memories of what he read and saw, he came to realization. Despite spending hours in the library, he had barely scratched the surface concerning the information that was available to the rank of Chunin. Rather than disguise himself as another Chunin or go through another charade while risking being caught, he instead decided to push for promotion and now wore the vest of a Chunin. He had foregone the high-collared shirt as it didn't mesh with the vest and instead had a hood sewn onto his vest as well as used white bandages and tied them around his neck and the bottom portion of his face. The bandages didn't cover the area around his mouth which was left open for using jutsu. He had also sealed his sword in a storage seal on the forearm that was typically used for holding his master's holocron and a second ninjato was attached to the back of his vest. It looked exactly like the ninjato he had made but was not. Naruto used the fake to fool people and unsealed his real ninjato when he had to. He wanted people to see the imitation of his real sword on his back and notice that there was nothing special about, which would lead them to think that any rumors about it were false. As the team reached the top of a small hill in the road, Kanoha was revealed to them in the distance. Naruto's eyes went directly to the Hokage monument, but he wasn't looking at the faces. He was looking through them, to the hideout that only he knew was there. Naruto often found himself glancing at the monument, and his thoughts would always wander to the stolen items that were hidden there. On some level, the knowledge always made him uneasy and paranoid about being caught. However, it was unlikely that it would be discovered considering the security and modifications to the hideout that he had made with his master's help. With the new seal information and following his master's teaching and instructions, he had fortified the hideout with a combination of Fuinjutsu and Sith runes. The entrance to the hideout was hidden with a force illusion that was created with the runes. While Naruto found he had little ability in genjutsu, with help from his play guys, he started learning how to make illusions with the help of Sith runes and was even working on using the ability to copy the effects of genjutsu that he knew of but couldn't use. With the entrance hidden, he had also placed a barrier seal over it to prevent anyone from entering, if they got past the illusion and detection seals so that he would know if anyone was near the main entrance to his hideout. The inside of the hideout had several other traps and the entire room had been reinforced with Sith runes to make the walls stronger and few injutsu had been used to prevent noise and chakra from being sensed by someone outside the room. A barrier was put on the noses of the Kagetu, on the off chance that someone thought of it, enter his hideout through the noses of the former and current Kage. With all the modifications he had made, Naruto was confident that a Hyuga would not be able to see into his hideout, and it would be hidden from them. Even if someone entered it, he used another application of Sith runes to produce a second force illusion inside of the hideout, and make anyone think it was just an empty space. From the scroll of seals, Naruto had added two more additions to the hideout. 
he added an extra trap to the entranceway and also used a powerful earth jutsu to create a second entrance to the hideout. The jutsu was made for the quick creation of bunkers and required a very large amount of chakra to use as well as a single fuin jutsu seal. Naruto used the technique to create a vertical shaft that went down into the rock of the mountain and to just below the level of the village. It then traveled to the building where his apartment was and he created a hidden entrance so that he wouldn't have to keep going to the Hokage Monument to access his hideout. He would only have to enter the hidden tunnel and walk directly there, unimpeded and unnoticed. Naruto actually went by the area anyway because the staircase to his apartment was on the inside of the building and the entrance to the secret tunnel was placed in the stairwell. The earth jutsu he used to create the tunnel pushed the rock away and compacted it to form solid walls while engraving a unique design on the surfaces of the tunnel that was the same as the seal used in the jutsu. The fuin jutsu was used to start the tunneling process and consisted of a rectangular seal that was placed on a smooth surface and it set the dimensions of the bunker system to be created. The design of the seal was engraved onto the walls as the jutsu worked and served to help keep the shape of the tunnel system being created. The user could also create rooms of different sizes besides just tunnels and even create multiple levels. The technique drained chakra based on how elaborate and big the bunker was so a person could easily try to create something too large and drain themselves of chakra. The technique was not slow but it was also not fast and Naruto didn't try to see exactly what he could do with the technique. He just created what he needed. The entrance in the stairwell was hidden with another illusion to make it appear as a solid wall and a person could even touch it and feel a solid surface as part of the illusion. Naruto wasn't sure if a dojutsu could pierce the illusions he was using for his hideout as he had read in, in the academy that they could do that but this wasn't a genjutsu. It was force illusion, so he wasn't sure. He did know that few people would look in the stairwell of his building for an entrance to a secret hideout. Naruto walked to that very entrance now as his team entered the village and went their separate ways while the Jonin sensei went to the Hokage Tower to brief the Sandame on the mission and fill out a mission report. A lot has changed since I stole the scroll of seals. Naruto mused while he walked to his apartment. He had found an incredible array of jutsu in the forbidden scroll and now had access to many powerful techniques. Many of the jutsu in the scroll involved the sacrifice of a person or the user, but the rest more than made up for that. It contained barriers and ninjutsu that did not have nature affinities tied to them. Naruto also found several fuinjutsu seals that were explained in detail which included a curse seal, a memory seal, and his own seal that was on his stomach and held back the kubi. Apparently a curse seal was any piece of fuinjutsu that was placed on an individual that spread across or was placed on their body and could have varied effects. Naruto read through the different applications and knew that he would have to develop one of his own. The memory seal was supposed to be able to seal off certain memories or all of person's memories. It was something that Naruto was very interested in as it would be much better than what he was currently using for memory removal, which removed everything and left nothing. However it could be removed by a person with enough sealing knowledge and experience but Naruto had a few ideas about that. His own seal was certainly of interest to him, and he learned about the existence of a key that went with his seal, but he had no idea who had this extra piece of fuinjutsu, and it worried him knowing that someone else had it. Probably the most interesting discovery had been the shadow clone jutsu which was by far the best clone jutsu that Naruto had ever encountered. He had mastered it in an hour, and could already make numerous perfect clones of himself to use to help his plans while he worked on something else. He had already used them to work on the hideout and put all of the Sith runes in place. Naruto also learned the other corresponding jutsu that went with the normal shadow clone jutsu which included the clone explosion jutsu, the shuriken shadow clone technique, earth release shadow clone, and the lightning release shadow clone. Naruto entered the stairwell of his building and created a shadow clone that was inside of the illusion that covered the new entrance to his hideout. Without missing a beat, the shadow clone substituted itself for the real Naruto without producing any smoke and the real Naruto continued walking into his hideout while the shadow clone proceeded up the staircase to go to his apartment. If anyone was watching he hoped the illusion would conceal the switch between himself and the clone but he had no real way of knowing that it was successful. Naruto hadn't been caught yet so he had a feeling it was working as he walked down the tunnel to the vertical shaft in the Hokage mountain. 
Naruto walked on into the darkness until he reached the vertical shaft. He never bothered to put any lighting in the tunnel as he could easily move in the dark. For a brief moment he crouched down and a wind picked up around him. Given that the shaft was small, he had figured out a better way than climbing it. It was also more fun. Using force jump he propelled himself up and then a burst of wind around him increased his speed. There was no way he could add something like an elevator, as he just didn't have the materials to do it, and wasn't going to frivolously spend money when he could do something else. After copying scrolls from the ninja library in the guise of Mizuki, Naruto had found out a great deal of information about how to train in using chakra natures and after he had been promoted to Chunin, he was allowed to purchase the special paper that allowed him to figure out what his affinities were. Previously, he had just been learning what he could get his hands on and wasn't concerned with which affinity he had. Once he used the chakra paper, he found that he had an affinity for wind and water. From that test, he knew that wind must be his primary affinity, but he wasn't sure if water was his secondary affinity, or he had an affinity for water because of his training to learn the Nidame's water jutsu. Everyone had a primary affinity, and it was the chakra nature that their chakra was naturally attuned to and could learn to use the easiest. Some people even developed a secondary affinity, or even a third affinity that worked the same way. Naruto's affinity for water, however, was not a secondary affinity but a developed affinity for water jutsu. He had used water chakra nature so much that his body developed an affinity for it but it was not natural like his primary affinity. A person could have up to three natural affinities and could develop the reset through training and using jutsu for those specific chakra natures. The natural affinity or affinities would always be better than the developed ones. Jutsu of the natural affinity would be easier to use and consume less chakra while jutsu with developed affinities would consume the same amount as each other but more than the natural affinity. Naruto never really bothered with it before because he was interested in learning all of the chakra affinities and using jutsu from all five. He had more than enough chakra so it didn't matter how much the jutsu consumed or whether it was a natural or developed affinity. Since he had the proper training techniques for learning to manipulate each of the elements, he had started learning all of them. From that point, he had almost mastered all five chakra natures. The only chakra nature that was giving him problems was fire which was taking him much longer than the others had. Before Naruto started that training, he already had learned some earth manipulation and had mastered the water manipulation. It had taken a long time but on a suggestion from Master Playguys, Naruto used his shadow clones to speed up the process and work on training in multiple things at once. Nearing the top of the shaft, Naruto slowed himself down and just came out of the opening in the floor landing gracefully on the ground of his hideout. Moving into another room of hideout he removed a few scrolls from his person and placed them into the slots in the alcove he had created from the rocky walls of the hideout. With earth manipulation, he had expanded his hideout to accommodate rooms giving him a place to sleep if he needed it as well as storage. The scrolls on this wall contained sums of money that he had acquired during several of his missions. He didn't steal from the clients but if he was raiding a bandit camp then some of the loot might go missing and no one would know. He also gambled on several occasions while his team stayed in a village with a casino. Things like that happened a lot on the missions he was a part of but no one had ever noticed, though he suspected that Kabuto knew of the stealing but the glasses-wearing spy had never said anything or alerted anyone to Naruto's transgressions. Naruto wasn't completely sure how much money was enough but at some point he had the feeling that he would need a lot of money to fix and refuel the ship. He couldn't convince everyone using his mind tricks and some items he might need couldn't be purchased locally. Those scrolls also had materials that he had picked up which included chakra metal that he planned for a few more weapons. He already had his sword but the new weapons he had in mind would be very different from a sword. Moving to another alcove, he looked through the scrolls there and selected two of them. They were vital for his masters and his own plans so he would need to take them on his next mission. The results of his extra activities during his next mission would determine what course he would take to get off of the planet and into the galaxy that he wanted to see. Naruto already knew what his next mission would be as the Hokage had informed him before he leaving for the mission he just returned from. He would be performing standard border patrol along with a few other ninja. 
They would patrol along the southeastern border of fire country which hardly received any notice because it didn't border with any countries with hidden villages like the northern and eastern borders of fire country did. This was exactly what Naruto had been waiting for and he went to the final scroll alcove to find a slightly larger scroll that fit on the small of his back. Naruto smiled as he had waited so long to test the item in the scroll and now he would finally have his chance. And it was exactly what he needed to complete his next task in the constraints that he had. Several days later, southern area of fire country. Minutes passed at a very slow rate as Naruto tried to wait patiently for the right moment. He was currently on lookout for a given time period of the night. The group he was with consisted of several chunin and a jonin. Naruto was woken up from his sleep to take the next watch, and now he was impatiently waiting until he knew that the ninja he was with were all asleep before he started his real mission. Every minute that passes gives me less time to complete what I came here for, thought Naruto as he was rather irritated and decided to try and meditate. Ten minutes later the ninja that had woken Naruto up for lookout duty was fast asleep and Naruto began his mission. With a single hand seal, he created a shadow clone to stay behind while he ran off in the direction of the ocean. Hopping from tree to tree, Naruto raced to get to the ocean as soon as possible so that he could use his alternative mode of transportation. It took almost half an hour to reach the ocean from where his patrol was camping for the night. Once he was on the shore, he pulled the medium-sized scroll from his back and set it on the ground, then opened it. The scroll just contained a large storage seal and he released the seal. After the smoke had cleared, Naruto reached down and activated the power source on the speeder bike and the repulsor lift in the vehicle quickly activated causing it to jump off the ground a couple of feet and stay there as if it was suspended or propped up by something. Naruto jumped on the bike and then smiled before pushing the throttle and seeing what the bike could do. Naruto could hardly get the smile off his face as he traveled at incredible speeds over the ocean. It was dark, and he was far enough out from the shore that he didn't have to worry about people spotting him and few boats were out at night. The only problem he was having was that the bike was so fast that his long journey was made rather short. He was traveling over 200 miles in less than half an hour, and the return trip would be just as short. It was a shame that he didn't have time to really figure out what this bike could do or take it for more of a joy ride. His lookout shift was only three hours long and that was the window of opportunity that he had to be back by in order to replace his shadow clone before waking someone for the next shift. He was headed to sea country, specifically to Jiro Island where Orochimaru had a secret base and laboratory which was run by a man named Amachi. While Naruto had great knowledge of many of the sciences what he didn't know was whether the two substances that he was bringing with him were possible to recreate with the technology and resources of his planet. He knew a great deal about technology and materials in the greater galaxy but his information was stunted when it concerned his own planet. What Naruto needed was a person that had knowledge of what this planet had and could determine if both substances could be reproduced and then mass produced. Both chemicals were paramount in getting the ship operational and having enough power to venture off the planet and through hyperspace. If they couldn't be recreated then he would have to find something else or come up with another solution. As of yet, he didn't have solid backup plans but he wasn't sure what other options Master Playguys might have. Naruto flipped his goggles down as he approached what he thought was the main island of Sea Country. Zooming in the with goggles, he changed course headed for one of the outlying islands that he believed to be Jiro Island which would have the hidden laboratory that he was after. Slowing the speeder bike down, Naruto moved to a small inlet which provided cover from any prying eyes. The laboratory had two entrances, one under the water and the other hidden in the rocks and riddled with traps. Naruto got off his speeder, turned off the power and repulsor lift, then sealed it back up in the scroll. Jumping from rock to rock, he made way to the main entrance of the complex. He wasn't planning to just ask Amachi or bargain with him for what he wanted done, he had something else in mind. Inside the facility. Amachi sat at his laboratory table in his main workspace. He was currently working on the first set of samples for his newest underwater super soldier formula. It was right before he looked through the lens of the microscope that he once again checked the cameras. He was a paranoid person by nature and made it a habit of always checking, multiple times a day, that his facility was secure. 
It was one of the reasons that he had moved the feeds from the camera system as well as the security monitoring alarms into his work area. The first few years he had been in this secret laboratory he had gotten fed up with constantly walking back and forth from his lab to the security room. No sooner had he looked at the monitors than he noticed the camera on the main entrance showed nothing but static. That camera had gone down before though, so he wasn't that concerned as the salt water tended to corrode everything over time, and the cameras just didn't last in that area of the complex. When he was about to turn back to his microscope the camera came back on but the second camera on his system went to static at the same moment. Amachi's eyes widened at this and he temporarily forgot the project that he was working on to give his full attention to the camera monitors and the alarm system which had yet to trip. While watching the monitors, the third camera, which was inside of the facility and covering the door went down as well. With a rapidly beating heart, Amachi left his work table and sat down in front of the monitors. He didn't have to wait long before the second camera came back on and then the fourth camera went out. Now in a panic, Amachi activated the traps inside of the facility that required power and went to get his ninja supplies. It was currently just himself in the complex complex but numerous traps littered the hallways that led to this part of the facility. If someone has entered then they will be in for quite a surprise. He thought with a reassuring chuckle as if it really was a person, none of the alarms or traps had been set off yet and he convinced himself that they would protect him and that it might just be a glitch in the system. Minutes passed and Amachi's eyes were glued to the monitors as camera after camera went off and then came back on moments later. It must be someone moving through the compound but, but how is it that the cameras aren't able to get anything? He questioned to himself as it didn't make sense that the cameras would temporarily go out and come back on. He knew of no technique that could possibly do this. As the cameras continued the strange progression, Amachi noticed that none of the traps had been triggered and even the alarm system hadn't been tripped. Who could be that familiar with the security to enter and proceed with such impunity? He wondered and his hands started shaking while a few beads of sweat formed on his forehead. Ever closer the unknown figure proceeded and never once was Amachi able to see who it was on the screens. Eventually, the camera right outside the laboratory went out and Amachi listened to what was happening. The door to this part of the facility was like a vault door, built to stop most ninjutsu and even exploding tags. Walking closer to the entrance he looked at the door and sighed as whoever it was must not have been able to get through. No sooner had he thought that, than the crank on the vault door started spinning on its own without anyone there to turn it. The uneasiness and fright quickly returned as the door was unlocked from the outside and swung open. The entrance was shrouded in shadow as Amachi watched with quick breaths as he tried to figure out who might be there and why the door had swung open by itself. A figure stepped through the shadow and while Amachi may still have been afraid of him, he was almost happy to see Orochimaru. Orochimaru walked through the vault door and chuckled at the frightened and wide-eyed Amachi, Kukukukuku. You almost seem happy to see me Amachi, stated Orochimaru. I had no idea it was you Orochimaru-sama. You definitely took me by surprise. You usually don't enter the facility in such a way and I thought it might be an intruder. I had no idea you were making an unscheduled visit, stated Amachi in relief from the ordeal but nervous about what the snake Sinin was doing there. I was in area and had a few samples for you to analyze, stated Orochimaru, and he reached into his ninja pouch to retrieve two small scrolls. Are they organic samples? Asked Amachi as he took the scrolls and brought them to an empty work table. Unrolling the scrolls he unsealed two vials. One had a clear viscous liquid and the other had a greenish liquid. No they are not organic. I wish to know as much about them as possible and know if they can be reproduced. You have one week. Stated Orochimaru in a serious voice and Amachi gulped slightly but nodded. He would have to put aside his current work but he was also interested in what the chemical substances that Orochimaru had brought him were. Stepping over to his equipment, he started up the machines that he would need and when he turned around, the vault door was shut and Orochimaru was nowhere to be seen. Looking over to the monitors he noticed nothing out of the ordinary but didn't think anything of it as Orochimaru was a very powerful ninja and could come and go as he pleased from his own hidden facility. Orochimaru emerged from an outcropping of rock like he was a part of the rock itself, 
and was engulfed by smoke a moment later to reveal Naruto. He moved to the scroll attached above his ninja pouches and removed it to unseal the speeder bike. It was a plan that he had come up with ever since he heard about his upcoming patrol mission. The only person Amachi would do something like that for, without question, was Orochimaru. Naruto didn't actually know how Orochimaru entered or exited the facility, and how he got into contact with Amachi. Figuring that Orochimaru was a person that liked to manipulate as well as play with his pawns, he decided to put Amachi on edge and scare him enough that he would think Naruto was the real Orochimaru and would be less likely to question anything. He knew some information about the facility, and enough information from Musumi's and Mizuki's memories to know how Orochimaru sounded and acted as well as what he looked like. Naruto needed Amachi to work on analyzing and figure out if it was possible to recreate the two substances. One sample was the main fuel that was needed to create the powerful reaction in the ship's reactor. The other sample was a substance that he had found which he believed could fix the micro-fractures on the ship's hull. It was an emergency sealant used for hull repairs which was called spatch coat. It was only made for quick fixes until proper repairs could be created but Naruto only needed to get from his planet to a planet in the known galaxy. From there he could secure another ship. He planned to use it to coat the areas of the hull that were damaged in the crash. This was the best option that he and his master could come up with given the technology that they had available. Unfortunately, even if the hull could be fixed, they still needed to make more fuel and Naruto hoped that it was possible. The only thing he could do was wait for a week, until his patrol came back to the area they were currently in, so he could travel back to sea country. Naruto made it back before the shift changed and replaced his shadow clone. When the agreed-upon time came up, he switched with another Chunin and then went to bed. A week later, around the same area of fire country. Making his way back to the facility, Naruto entered in a much quicker and stealthy manner like he had exited the last time. He was very curious to see what Amachi had found out about the substances he had given the scientist. The results of the analysis would change his and his master's future plans and determine when they would be getting off of the planet. Naruto didn't let the possibility of not ever getting off the planet cross his mind as he was dead set on seeing the rest of the galaxy. In the guise of Orochimaru, Naruto entered the main part of the lab Amachi was working on something and Naruto's eyes wandered to the security monitors. He didn't notice anything in most of them, but nearly the last monitor had a girl tied down to a table somewhere in the facility. Naruto's eyes widened at this as he wondered what Amachi would be doing kidnapping a young girl. Amachi. Orochimaru said in an even voice and couldn't keep the smile off his face when Amachi jumped in his seat and turned around to find the Sinin right behind him. As sorry Orochimaru-sama, you startled me. I wasn't sure when to expect you. Amachi said nervously and went to retrieve the samples that had been given to him the previous week as well as two manila folders which Naruto assumed contained the results of the testing. I analyzed the two samples as you requested. The first sample and Amachi held up the vial containing the ship fuel, is like nothing I have seen before. I don't think it can be replicated at all. Frankly I can't recognize some of its composition. May I ask where you acquired it? Question Amachi and the response he got was, no you may not. And Naruto had to keep the scowl off his face at the news about the fuel. Frowning slightly, Amachi continued, the second sample can be replicated and I could see several uses for it. It stays in an incredibly viscous state until it is exposed to the air then it begins to expand slightly, and eventually hardens to an incredible degree. Again, I've never seen anything quite like it. Stated Amachi while examining the vial again at the curious substance. Naruto was relieved that at least one of the substances was viable, and now he had a way to patch the hull of the ship. It wasn't a permanent solution, and he would have to create a large amount of the sealant for the entire bottom hull, but it would be sufficient until he could either get the ship properly repaired or get a new ship instead. Orochimaru reached out and took the samples from Amachi, and before Naruto could do anything else, he spoke, Since you're already here, I would like to tell you that my research is progressing. Stated Amachi with a smile, and Naruto managed to keep in character. I suppose that is why you have kidnapped the girl inquired Orochimaru with a slight glance at the monitoring device. Amachi nodded and said yes, exactly. I haven't injected her with the serum yet, 
but this time I think the test will be a success, not like the last subject that expired shortly after injection. I've corrected the problems, but if something does happen I can always dissect her to find out what went wrong. Amachi turned around to get some of his notes, or something to show Orochimaru and Naruto looked at the man in front of him, and then back to the monitor. His eyes narrowed and he no longer believed Amachi could be of any use to him. Naruto reached a secluded place on the main island of sea country, and once again unsealed the speeder bike from the scroll. The girl was now in the local hospital, and Amachi's corpse would likely wash ashore sometime the next day or perhaps that night. Naruto blinked and tried to focus and ignore the headache. He had taken a large amount of information from Amachi before he killed him and was still trying to sort through it which could be difficult depending on how much information was taken. He now knew exactly what he would need to produce the sealant for repairing the ship and now he would only need the money and equipment to do it. Unfortunately he couldn't use much of the medical knowledge he had taken from Amachi, given that his chakra control wasn't good enough. However, the information he wanted to know about technology and materials on this planet that were available to him was very useful. The problem was the power source for the ship. The fuel was no longer an option, and he would now have to remove the reactor assembly from the ship and replace it with something else. The ship required a large amount of power to be able to use the hyperdrive, and he wasn't sure how he would be able to find something else that could produce that kind of power. The ship's reactor easily produces orders of magnitude more power than all of Kanoha requires on a yearly basis. I can't replace it with just anything. It needs to be something that produces an incredible amount of power. If I can't find it then I'll just have to build it, thought Naruto and he sighed as he knew that building a reactor that would meet his power requirements would be incredibly difficult using the limited supplies and resources of this planet. A small smile did cross his face as he thought about what kind of reactor he could make, what he would need to make it, and the challenge it would be. Nearly a month later. Kabuto walked to the usual meeting place for his team, but his mind was definitely elsewhere. He kept in touch with Orochimaru as well as a few other spies working for the snake Sinin through coded correspondence in the medical journals that he regularly received. From the last message that he just got, Kabuto learned Amachi was found dead almost a month ago. The scientist's body had apparently washed up on the main island of sea country, but it took so long to reach Kabuto because no one could identify the body. From an autopsy report done in the local hospital, the man had apparently drowned. This was of great concern to Kabuto because Amachi hardly ever left his lab and a scientist working on creating the perfect underwater super soldier was not likely to drown. Unless his own creation had killed him thought Kabuto but that was unlikely as he had no report of Amachi having any success. It had only been found that Amachi was missing when the agent who frequently brought supplies to the hidden facility found it abandoned and began trying to find out what happened. The equipment was missing and all the research, which initially had led the agent to believe that Amachi had run off. If it were not for the fact that he had been dead for several weeks by that point, then Sound Ninja would be actively searching for the man. Numerous questions were going through Kabuto's head. What had happened? How was the hidden facility discovered? Who was behind it? Where was the research? Was Orochimaru-sama's spy network in danger, and was there a leak? Is my cover in danger? Unfortunately, none of the questions he had could be answered at this point. Kabuto doubted even Orochimaru had the answers to all of these questions. The most important question at this point was who had found out about the facility. It was well hidden and had been for over a decade. Kabuto thought. The list of people who could have found it was small. Akatsuki was on that list, as well as Jiraiya, and perhaps a few others. However, that didn't explain why Amachi was killed and the research missing. Kabuto doubted that Akatsuki, at least what he knew of the group, would be interested in Amachi's research. They would have been after information about Orochimaru-sama's whereabouts. They wouldn't have made his death look like an accident or been concerned with the research. For Jiraiya it would also be the same. He thought and that left a very short list and the possibility of an unknown third party, or possibly hidden village. As Kabuto's mind worked, he wondered if this could have had anything to do with Masumi's death. The man's mind was accessed after all. He thought. Could someone have found out about the base and then waited to take it? That also seemed unlikely as if they knew about the hideout, 
they would have acted immediately and not waited several years. Danzo was still a possibility as the man did have the resources to do it. Kabuto was positive that if the old warhawk had a chance, he wouldn't hesitate to kill Orochimaru, try to destroy any link between them, or perhaps steal research. However, that wouldn't explain why he would kill Amachi as the man could be valuable to him. Arriving at the meeting spot, Kabuto sat down and continued to go over the possibilities while waiting for the Jonin sensei to arrive. He didn't take much note of Naruto who was sitting not very far away. This was not the first time that Naruto had heard the name of Danzo in the thoughts of certain people in the village. A few years ago, Naruto gleaned the name from the Sandame's thoughts, and this was the second time that he had felt Kabuto thinking about Danzo as well. Naruto hadn't been very concerned the first time Kabuto thought of it, which was when they first became a team. The name had no meaning to him at the time, and he couldn't gather what meaning it had to Kabuto either as several other names appeared in the man's thoughts along with that one. After Naruto had felt the Sandame thinking about Danzo, he had started looking into it to find out who this Danzo was and why both the Sandame and Kabuto were thinking about the same person. Unfortunately, his search turned up very little. It wasn't until he stumbled upon the name in the older records section of the archives library that he found some mention. Apparently Shimura Danzo was a former ninja of the village and was currently retired. Naruto found scarce information about the man but just from the picture alone, he could tell that there was something else going on. He felt it through the force and play guys had told him to try and dig deeper. The most that he had managed to find out was that Danzo was now a member of the village elders but he wasn't really an advisor to the Sandame. However he did go to all of the ninja council meetings. It was odd because Naruto really couldn't find a reason for Danzo to be at those meetings as no other retired ninja attended the council meeting and it would seem whatever reason was hidden from nearly everyone that wasn't on the council or perhaps old enough to know. This was a problem but not something that he couldn't figure out. It seemed that Danzo was definitely a person that worked from the shadows and since so few people had ever heard of him, despite holding enough status in the village to be on the ninja council, that meant that there was much more to it than just being a veteran ninja. Playguys had told him to look into it when possible but focus on their real priorities. Naruto turned his head and looked towards the approaching sensei. A few moments later, the Jonin sensei arrived and they went to the Hokage Tower to get a mission. The team still met occasionally as Naruto only had a few mission and duties as part of his rank so he still did missions and worked with his original team. The real priority that Naruto had now was not looking into shady figures in the village, but getting money, a large amount of money. It would be difficult as he couldn't draw attention to himself. The question was, where could he get such an amount of money and how much would he need? Once he had the money, he could purchase the proper equipment for his needs, as building a reactor would be rather difficult. From talking with Playguys, they had decided that building a fusion generator would be the best idea. The ship already had a small fusion generator that was for emergency power. Based on looking over the device and the combined knowledge and ideas from of both master and student, they believed that a larger fusion generator could be created that would be enough to power the propulsion and other vital systems of the ship. A starship's main power consumption was the engines. The weapons did need power but most ship weapons were not that draining and neither were any of the other systems. It was the engines and hyperdrive that were the most power-consuming. The hyperdrive actually needed less power than the engines when they were being used but they still needed to actually lift off from the planet and get into space so enough energy had to be generated from the reactor to at least achieve orbit with the engines. Naruto had already thought up a way to get the ship out of the lake and it wouldn't alert the village nor would it require him to use the force to try and lift it completely out of the lake. He only needed to lift the ship to the surface for what he had in mind. Later that day, Naruto looked up and down the street his team was currently walking along in Tanzakugai. They were heading to deliver a scroll to a simple merchant, and would likely spend the night in the village. This wasn't the first time he had been in this particular village. The last time his team had been here he was thrown out of every casino and backroom gambling place in the village. They all suspected him of cheating but couldn't prove anything. The fact was that he was just lucky and had too many other abilities to not win so much. He didn't even have to try to get mental images of other players' cards or determine what the next card in a deck might be. It didn't matter what the game was either, 
he won so easily that he always got thrown out eventually. A henge also wouldn't work for long, and he had even tried to purposely lose once in a while but ended up winning too much in the end. Whereas most found it difficult to win at gambling, Naruto found it difficult not to win. He had therefore stopped trying to get money through gambling. Stealing wasn't really getting him anywhere though. He was only able to steal small amounts, and he knew that he would need more than he could get through these methods and much more money than he could get from being a ninja of Konoha. Naruto had thought about stealing money from a wealthy individual, but no one living in or around Konoha had that much money and stealing from multiple people or doing anything else to bring attention to him would be a bad idea. The village may be prospering but it wasn't full of wealthy people and neither was Tanzakagai or any of the other villages in Fire Country, save perhaps the capital. What we need is a someone that we can easily manipulate that has a great deal of money. We won't need to steal, blackmail, or threaten them. I already have something in mind, said Playguys through their connection and Naruto mentally acknowledged what his master was saying. I suppose all I need to do is ask around and find a few names, thought Naruto, and he knew that they would have a little free time later that night to spend in the town after the mission was completed. He knew it shouldn't be too hard to find a few names that could be useful to them. Later that night, the man dropped to the ground and Naruto's shadow clone dragged him to the alley wall and leaned the man against it, then put an empty bottle from the trash in the man's hand. Anyone passing by would just think the man passed out from drinking. The man would wake up with a headache and think he had a hangover. After making sure that his sensei and teammates weren't following him, Naruto had headed out on his information-gathering mission. This was actually the fourth person whose mind Naruto had looked through. He had started out talking to a few drunken merchants and asking questions that would bring to their minds a very greedy person with more money than they could ever need and they would associate a name with that person which Naruto could glean from their minds. After getting a few names that way, he decided to look in further detail in the minds of a few local criminals to find names from them. What Playguys really wanted was a rich and unsavory person that was already involved in illegal dealings. The former Sith Lord reasoned that a person with illegal dealings, that had yet to be caught, would definitely know how to acquire what they wanted without gaining too much attention or making anyone curious. Naruto had agreed with his master's reasoning and sifted through the names he got from both parties until he found crossovers. The name Gata came up with several of the criminals and several of the merchants. Apparently the man owned a shipping company, and not just any shipping company, but the largest on the planet. The man had apparently gotten to such a status through buying out and bullying the other shipping companies as well as using his legitimate business for illegal contraband shipments. He also hadn't been caught or even implicated in any wrongdoing and held high regards with the normal public while being known well by criminals. From what he found out, Gatu was currently in Wave Country which the merchants found rather funny as Wave wasn't known for anything except fishing and only had a small port. They seemed to think that Gatu was going senile for even going there as that the county had no foreseeable value to someone of Gatu's wealth. The information greatly intrigued both master and student as it promised everything they were after and more. Greedy, owned a shipping company, involvement in illegal activities while not being caught, and was currently isolated. Playguys was very interested in what a person like Gatu was doing in a country like Wave and had already come up with several theories which he didn't share with his student as he wanted Naruto to come up with his own reasons. It might be a little while before he would have enough time to get to Wave country as his duties as Chunin were demanding and didn't leave him with large blocks of time in which to sneak off from the village or while on a mission. Naruto had contemplated riding his speeder bike above the trees to get there faster but he could be spotted by a patrol. He would have to be patient and wait for a break in his duties to head off to the small group of islands that made up Wave Country. Chapter 9 Playguys looked around from his vantage point in the hideout at all of the Naruto's that were in the room and working on a variety of projects. The shadow clones were divided up into groups and each group was working on a specific technique. One group was working on chakra flow and putting it into a weapon. Another group was doing various chakra control techniques for medical ninjas from information obtained from Amachi's mind. Several giant shuriken were being telekinetically moved around one area of the hideout by at least three clones. Each clone was controlling two shuriken at once in preparation for a pair of new weapon that another Naruto was designing. 
The last group of clones were reading through a large number of scrolls that were copied from the library. So far, their plans for getting back to the known galaxy were coming along faster than Playguys had anticipated. For the most part, he had stepped aside to give Naruto more leeway in making decisions and gave him occasional tasks to test him as well as advice. As long as the ship remained safe then everything would be fine, and he made sure that nothing major had happened to impede them. Playguys expected far more complications and bigger mistakes by his student, but nothing had been a setback for them. Naruto made plenty of mistakes but all of them were minor, and he had learned from them. It was a tactic that he used when teaching Sidious. He would normally severely punish failure and mistakes but he was far more lenient with Naruto than Sidious. Playguys was also unable to do much with his current condition and punishment was out of the question anyway. The last thing he needed was his newest student plotting against him. Playguys could also tell that there would come times in the future where Naruto would be on his own or separated from him, and it was best to make sure that he could plan and work separately but for the same goal. Turning his attention to the real Naruto, who was meditating nearby and coordinating the clones, Playguys had many thoughts concerning the ninja of this planet. From the information and observations that he and his student had gathered, Playguys found himself with many more questions than answers. He was still trying to figure out how chakra worked and changed the world around the ninja as well as influence the body. While Jedi could make themselves faster with Force Run, ninja seemed to become just as faster or faster and sustain it for longer, while also possessing far more stamina than he believed humanly possible. Playguys still wasn't sure just how strong they could become either. He had Naruto undergo many different training methods that even included attaching weights to his arms and legs but it never seemed to produce a cutoff. Naruto just kept adjusting to the weight and getting stronger. It made Playguys question whether there was a limit. From what he learned at the academy, the Yandane was apparently so fast that he became a yellow blur of motion and Senju Tsunade could destroy rocks and buildings with a single punch with her chakra-enhanced strength. It made him wonder where the physical limits of the body stopped, and Chakra took over to augment and produce the desired results. How fast and how strong could a ninja be without using any Chakra? Strength on that level was something that a Jedi could never do. They couldn't enhance their strength with the Force. They could augment the body for a brief period but Playguys had never heard of a Jedi using the Force to increase their physical strength to lift heavy objects. This was something that he had recently started working on with Naruto and a group of clones in another room of the hideout had already been allocated to that task. Playguys found it very interesting that the more he found out about Chakra, the more he questioned what was possible with the Force. The Jutsu from the Scroll of Seals were incredibly interesting and Playguys was impressed with how many different Kenjutsu that ninja had developed. At this point, Naruto had only learned the Jutsu that they would need or that they both wanted to investigate. They had only managed to examine a portion of all the techniques that the scroll had to offer. Fuinjutsu was also something that greatly interested him as it was slightly similar to Sith runes. They could both do incredible things but there appeared to be little overlap between the two. Sith runes couldn't seal objects into a temporary pocket dimension to hold them there until called back by unsealing the item. Such a simple technique used by ninja every day was still hard to grasp for playguys. It was so archaic with the paper and ink, yet on the other hand it was an incredibly advanced dimensional and time-space technique that was made completely simple and for everyday use. It wasn't even technology but created from simple materials and some chakra, yet it trumped anything that the rest of the galaxy possessed for storage purposes. The whole process intrigued Playguys to an incredible degree as it pulled together several of his interests. The more they discovered about Fuinjutsu, the more interested Playguys became. Medical ninjutsu was another interesting discovery, especially when Naruto absorbed the knowledge from Amachi. Playguys was intrigued at how chakra could be used to heal as it was more advanced than what could be done with the Force. Healing with the Force could be rather tricky, and only a few were able to use any healing techniques, and they didn't seem as versatile as with chakra. Looking toward a nearby clone Playguys watched as that Naruto looked over the maps and memorized anything that might be useful for his journey to Wave Country to find Gatu of Gatu Shipping Incorporated. The plan was rather simple and made even easier by Gatu himself. The billionaire shipping tycoon had isolated himself on a country that had no ninja and only a small population. 
The country itself was barely noticeable on the map, and Playguys had a feeling that he knew why the rich man was there in the first place. The reason for the planning was the lack of information about the location they were headed. The mission itself didn't require a large amount of planning but it was always good to have a backup plan and escape route if things went bad. The escape route was rather obvious as the ocean would provide Naruto all the cover he would need with the ninjutsu that he possessed. While most countries had detailed maps, Wave Country was barely marked on most maps that Naruto could get his hands on and a detailed map of the wave was impossible to find in Konoha. The best that Naruto could do was a map that detailed the eastern region of Fire Country, and that had the most detailed view of Wave that could be found. Only a single town in Wave Country was marked with a dot, and it didn't have a name. Wave didn't appear to be rocky, and seemed mostly flat. On the best map they had, Naruto counted around 20 islands that were all very close to each other, and on the other maps he had looked at so far, it was always drawn as a single island instead of multiple islands that were close together. Playguys noted a change in his real student meditating near him and knew that his student had just received information from one of his clones and now the process of absorbing all the collective training would begin. Naruto assumed a meditative position and one by one, each group stopped what they were doing and disappeared in plumes of white smoke. Although Naruto had his eyes shut, Playguys could see the rapid eye movement as the effects of force comprehension did its work. The Force ability was used to absorb and interpret large amounts of information in a short amount of time by speeding up the person's neural processes. A caveat of this technique was that the user had to have some knowledge of whatever they were comprehending and they couldn't absorb knowledge they knew nothing about. However, since Naruto was absorbing the knowledge directly from his clones, that problem was avoided because his clones were him and therefore he could learn anything using this method. The process was finished and Naruto opened his eyes and they quickly refocused on the hideout he was sitting in. Naruto went to get up but wavered and collapsed back to the ground. He was still conscious but disoriented. Playguys merely shook his head as his student should have known by then that the mental fatigue from his shadow clones would take a little while to wear off. The first time it happened, Naruto had used a very large amount of clones and had them dispel all at once. He was unconscious for three hours and that was the reason why Playguys had imposed a limit on how many clones could be created at once. Naruto had gotten a short break from missions and would be taking Playguys to Wave Country the following day. He would be leaving a shadow clone in the village but it wouldn't last for more than a few days so there was a small window of opportunity for completing the mission. Nearing Wave Country, two days later. Naruto arrived at the coast exactly where he had planned. Standing on the shore, he instantly noticed the bridge that stretched a portion of the distance from Wave Country to Fire Country. That wasn't on the map or in anything that I heard about. Naruto thought and Playguys added, This country seems to be so far off everyone's radar that they don't have regular contact with it or really care what happens. This should help us. Naruto agreed with his master's thoughts and proceeded to move out past the waves of the shore and to steadier waters. Once there he was quickly swallowed by the water. Why run on top of the water when he could move unseen by traveling through it? While Naruto moved through the water, he never saw a small boat that had just disembarked from Fire Country for Wave Country. Two people were on board. The taller one carried a very large sword on his back. It took only a few minutes while in the main town of Wave Country to find where Gata lived. The shipping mogul lived near the docks in a large mansion that was well guarded. Gatu apparently built numerous warehouses and enlarged the port in Wave to accommodate his larger ships. Naruto bypassed all of the workers and hired guards as he made his way into Gata's compound. The mansion was rather easy to break into as it had many rooms and all but a few were currently occupied, nor did it seem that they were ever occupied. Naruto felt the life signs in the area and made his way to the only group of them in the building. Walking up to the door of what he thought was the study, Naruto waved his arm at the two samurai standing guard at the door and said, I have an appointment. Stand aside. And both guards put their swords back fully in their sheaths and replied, You have an appointment. We'll let you pass. And Naruto did just that but not before saying, I was never here and you should both take your lunch break. Walking into the room, Naruto immediately caught Gata's attention, who the hell they are. But he was silenced by Naruto's use of force grip. Whiling holding the frightened man with one hand, Naruto moved to him, 
and then reached out his other hand to begin the first part of the plan. This appears to be the place, Sabuzasama, stated Haku while they both looked at the compound in front of them. Sabuza merely grumbled a response. This was the only job that he could secure that would provide protection from the hunter Nien of Kiri. It was isolated and considering how few people ever came to the country, they likely wouldn't encounter another ninja. He and Haku had come to make the final arrangements with the client, and the demon brothers would follow shortly. They were expected and walked through the gate. Both ninja kept their eyes out for any sign of trouble, or a double cross which could be very commonplace to a missing mean for hire. Nothing was out of the ordinary until they passed two samura that walked out of the front door of the mansion. Neither swordsman seemed to be really paying attention, and just walked right past Sabuza and Haku without really noticing. Sabuza was instantly on guard as he knew that something was wrong. His first thought was that the guards had been put under a genjutsu since they seemed rather unresponsive, and he glanced at Haku. She nodded and they both got their weapons out as they moved inside the mansion with haste. It was still possible that it was a double cross or a trap but it was even more likely that it was an assassination of their client. Someone's coming, stated Playguys through their link and Naruto opened his eyes and abruptly stopped the drain knowledge technique. It had only been a few moments since he started and someone was coming? It didn't make sense and using his own sense, Naruto found two signatures that were almost on top of him. He briefly wondered how he had missed their presence but he remembered that his master's sense was lessened because of his condition and he himself was distracted with the technique. It looks like we will have to do things a little differently, master, Naruto said over the link. A moment later the door burst open and two Kuri ninja entered. Naruto removed his hand from Gatu as the standoff started. The ninja looked at him and Gatu and he stared at them. Before Gatu became lucid again, he knocked out the short man and had to dodge several samban the next moment. With a large burst of smoke that concealed part of him and Gatu, Naruto stood with his sword unsealed but instead of staying to fight, he jumped out the window. The larger ninja ran after Naruto while the shorter masked one checked Gatu's vitals to make sure he was alright, then left through the broken window as well. In the chaos of the situation, either Kiri ninja paid much attention to the metal pyramid-shaped object that sat on Gatu's lap. Naruto ran on the roofs of the warehouses through the dark area. From the bingo book, he believed he recognized the ninja chasing him as one of the seven swordsmen of Kiri. Naruto had never fought such a strong opponent before as the man was listed either at A or S rank in the bingo book, and he couldn't help but wonder how he would manage against him. He had yet to face such a strong opponent in any combat situation. As part of the escape plan if things should go south, Naruto changed direction heading away from the warehouses and to the ocean. If anything happened, he would make sure that he could get away. He frowned however when he realized that the other ninja was catching up fast but that also meant that his master would be able to complete the mission. Before Gato woke up and after making sure that the ninja were gone, Playguys' spirit form came out of the holocron. This was not something that he had expected his apprentice to do but it also presented an opportunity and meant that he could have a larger role in their plans. Concentrating for a moment, Plagueis' spirit condensed and then swiftly moved into Gata's body. Said man woke up in a silent scream before he passed out again. Originally the plan had been for Plagueis to use his mind control on the shipping magnate, and Naruto would occasionally visit Wave to give Gata further instructions and orders. That way Naruto could remain in Kanoha and no one would ever notice he had been gone. Draining the man's knowledge would also give them all the information they needed on Gata's operations. Plans changed though, and now Plagueis was going through the process of possessing Gatu. It wasn't transfer of essence but merely his spirit overriding control of the man's body and pushing aside Gata's mind and will for full control. Plagueis wasn't sure how long it would last until the body started failing from the strain as he had never tried to possess any before, especially not someone without midichlorians. He had been curious for quite some time to see if possession was possible on someone of Naruto's planet by a force user like himself, considering the differences in energy and the fact that Chakra repelled the force on some level. Playguys had been hesitant to try it on someone in Konoha, especially a ninja with larger Chakra reserves, and risk being discovered or have another unexplained death in the village. 
However Gatu wasn't a ninja and only had civilian amounts of chakra that were never used and play guys could inhabit the body while not affecting his already limited force power that he had in his current form. He would have to channel the force from his spirit, through Gatu's body, but it was possible. Checking the progress, Gatu's mind was being pushed asty to make room for his own, and it seemed the process would be successful. This should work out nicely. After the process is complete I will need to set up communication with Naruto and deal with the two Kiri ninja. Thought play guys as he started looking through Gata's memories to figure out everything he would need to know in order to impersonate the short man and take over the shipping company as well as the criminal activities. Naruto jumped to avoid the throne Zanbato as it spun past him and embedded itself into the wooden pier of the dock. Zabuza's figure appeared in a burst of speed and stood watching Naruto from the handle of his sword. They were each sizing the other up, Naruto on the surface of the ocean, and Zabuza on his sword. Naruto ignored the killing intent coming from the swordsman, and could feel the second Kiri ninja hiding in the piers. He thought that they were waiting for him to let his guard down or see if he was affected by the killing intent so he made a seal under his cloak, and created a water clone under the water, and it swam over the second person's location. Zabuza stared at the short-cloaked assassin, and wondered not only who he was but how he was able to shrug off the killing intent being projected onto him. He would have thought the brat was around ten years old but that he didn't seem that afraid of facing him. The heartbeat was slightly elevated but not terrified and besides being noticeably tense, Zabuza could find no other signs that the ninja in front of him was afraid or not prepared for a fight. He also noticed the interesting sword that the boy had and wondered if he could even wield it properly. Naruto watched Zabuza and took an opening stance of the Form 6 of lightsaber combat which was called Naiman. Both hands were on his ninjato that was held in front of him with the blade downward at the water. Naruto found that he always moved toward that style of swordsmanship more than any other style that was taught to him by his master. It had no strengths but no weaknesses either and was created to be used with two swords slash lightsabers which is eventually what Naruto wanted to wield. He couldn't give up on his ninjato, but he also wanted a lightsaber so Play Guys had started working more on Naiman which was a combination of four of the other styles of lightsaber combat. Zabuza raised an eyebrow at the stance and jumped down to the water surface while taking his sword with him and putting it on his back. Forming a single hand seal, he said, hidden mist technique. Naruto watched as mist came over the water and then enveloped the entire area of the harbor that they were in. Perhaps it was arrogant, but he wanted to test his abilities with his sword as this was the first real chance that he had since its forging to face off against an experienced swordsman. He could have used the force to surprise his opponent, and possibly even finish the fight but despite the risk, he wanted to fight with his sword as much as possible to test himself. Naruto didn't move from his stance and instead felt as well as listened to his surroundings. Using his ability to sense life signs through the force, he could tell exactly where Zabuza was. The opposing swordsman didn't seem to be moving either, and Naruto wondered why. A moment later his hearing picked up an attack heading straight for him, and he ducked as a familiar Zanbato emerged from the mist. Naruto struck back and moved under the man's guard to, to cut him in half. His ears were greeted with splashing water, and he realized that he was facing water clones, which explained why he couldn't sense them with his life signs ability, as they didn't have any and were just water and chakra. Naruto killed several more water clones in the same fashion and noticed that the real Zabuza was on the move towards him. Closing his eyes as they were currently useless to him in the thick mist, Naruto focused using his force sense and basic farsight techniques taught to him by his master. Naruto quickly dodged Zabuza's swing but found upon retaliating that his opponent was able to equally anticipate and block his attacks. Zabuza was both faster and stronger than him, but Naruto was able to keep from getting killed or maimed because of his master's training and his small size. After being pushed back and narrowly avoiding strikes from Zabuza and from a waiting water clone, Naruto created a few water clones of his own to distract his opponent. He used this time to work on a different strategy. Zabuza had the advantage in blade length, but that could be changed. Putting chakra in the vibration components of his blade, Naruto went back on the offensive. Cleaving through another water clone, Naruto was forced to dodge as Zabuza swung to decapitate him. He quickly ducked under the slice but stuck his sword up, perpendicular to the water to catch Zabuza's sword on the swing. 
A horrible sound of grinding metal followed and he was thrown back by the force of the man's blow but was rewarded when he heard a plop sound in the water which indicated that his strategy had worked. Zabuza's sword was now much shorter. Zabuza went slightly at the sound of the blades grinding against each other and was about to wonder what had happened before he noticed that upon completing his swing, his blade felt lighter. The realization didn't hit him until he heard the sound of something dropping into the water. Retreating slightly, he moved into an area where the mist wasn't nearly as strong and examined his blade. Son of a bitch, he mentally raged when he saw that the top third of his blade was missing and he noted several notches on the rest of the blade from the battle. How the hell did that happen? He questioned but then thought perhaps his opponent's blade was destroyed as well. Of course at that very moment Naruto emerged from the thicker fog and Zabuza could clearly see his undamaged sword and it seemed to be sparking with lightning. Naruto cautiously followed his opponent through the thick fog and into an area of the edge of the technique. His opponent was standing in front of him, and when Zabuza looked at his sword and the feeling of the surrounding area changed. It became far more oppressive than it had been and Naruto could see a visible demon appear over Zabuza that was directed at him. Naruto had never felt such killing intent before and froze where he stood. This was much worse than what Zabuza had produced before, and it felt like a weight was pressing down on him. He opened his eyes and could only watch as Zabuza charged at him with his Zambato ready for a bisecting swing. The figure of a demon above Zabuza never dissipated and Naruto couldn't understand what it was he was seeing. Genjutsu, some other kind of illusion, or was it all in his head? If he could figure out what it was, then he might be able to break the technique that was being used against him. As Zabuza neared him, Naruto felt like he wasn't going to be able to live past that moment, but then something happened. He felt a sharp pain travel through his hand and up the arm that was holding his sword. The pain brought him back to the battle, and he narrowly ducked under the blade that sliced the air over his head. Naruto, however, wasn't prepared for the follow-up low kick that sent him skipping and then skidding across the water to a stop in the thicker fog. Managing to keep himself on top of the water, Naruto was back on his feet and aware of his surroundings as well as the pain in his chest from the kick. A moment later, Zabuza pressed his advantage and tried to create an opening to finish Naruto off or deal any blow that he could. Naruto was getting more and more angry as the fight continued. He still couldn't believe that he froze. It if wasn't for whatever his sword did, then he would have died. All the training and I nearly died in the beginning minutes of my first real battle he thought while evading the heavy and fast strikes of his opponent. Naruto had yet to use any offensive force powers but he wasn't thinking about that. He wasn't about to die there as he would fail his master and ruin their plans and his dream of seeing the galaxy. Channeling his anger, Naruto tried to hold his ground as best as he could. Zabuza still had many advantages over him except when it came to weapons. Naruto now knew for a fact that his sword was much better than his opponent's. With successive attacks, he was making cuts and notches in Zabuza's blade and had already taken another sliver off the end. It was at that point that Zabuza started becoming more defensive as he was losing more of his sword to Naruto's ninjato and stopped his advance while retreating back. Naruto didn't think it was odd and pressed Zabuza even more. Zabuza jumped back and increased the distance between them but Naruto wasn't about to let him use any hand seals and using the force he pulled Zabuza towards him with the intent of cutting him in half with his blade. Zabuza was surprised when he was yanked forward by an unseen force and was unable to block as the ninja cut through his blade and body. It was at the point where Naruto finished the swing that Zabuza's body turned into water and he heard something from behind him. Water Prison Technique Water came up from beneath Naruto and formed a spherical prison around him. The water was much harder than normal and filled with Zabuza's chakra so it prevented him from escaping. Placing his hand into the sphere to keep it stable, Zabuza was about to gloat when he heard someone behind him. Quickly jumping into the air, Zabuza was shocked when he saw the same technique that he had just used try to capture him. The boy he had captured turned to water as the clone and sphere of water lost consistency. Zabuza didn't jump very far and just enough to escape the technique. He had been using the technique for years and knew that it did leave the user open so as soon as he landed on the water surface, he charged his opponent. Naruto was still standing where he had been and holding the handle of his sword in his teeth with his hands in the final hand seal for the prison technique. 
rather than trying to dodge the charging former Kiri ninja, he did something that Zabuza didn't accept and jumped into his own water prison technique. No sooner than he was inside, than Zabuza's blade clanged against the steel like water. Clever little brat. Zabuza thought and considered what he should do next. He wished he knew some lightning jutsu, but that was not the case and had to think of another option, or he would just wait until the boy ran out of air or chakra and was forced to end the technique. Siding inside his protective sphere, Naruto considered his options. Looking to his sword he noticed for the first time that it was sparking with electricity which was odd considering he wasn't touching it, it was suspended in the water next to him, and he hadn't been channeling lightning chakra into it. The strangest part was that the short sparks of lightning weren't spreading that far through the conductive water or electrocuting him. Deciding to investigate this later, Naruto continued thinking of his next move while he noticed that Sabuza was patiently waiting outside the sphere for him to come out for air. Despite the mouth coverings on the man, he could tell that Sabuza was smirking. Sifting through possible next moves, Naruto's mind came up with a plan seconds later, and he went into action. Standing outside the sphere, Zabuza smiled as he thought the boy had backed himself into a corner or sphere, so to speak. He wondered what would be the next move as he noticed the boy who was in deep concentration, and then his eyes widened when the cloaked boy went through hand seals and he had a foreboding feeling. Two techniques at once? He thought and wondered how it was possible, or what training the boy must have gone through to be able to perform a new technique while still holding the original. Zabuza didn't recognize the sequence of hand seals for the technique but could tell because of the bird hand seal at the end that it was likely a water jutsu. The effects of the jutsu took hold when water not only started to gather from the surrounding air but it was pulled forth from below and created a large vortex around the sphere of water. Zabuza didn't know exactly what was going on but he knew to move away from the technique as fast as possible. Water release. Water shockwave. Thought Naruto inside the techniques and water gushed out from the top of the vortex creating a huge wave of that chased after Zabuza. Shit! Zabuza thought as he glanced back to see a gigantic wave of water chasing him. He wasn't able to outrun the technique and even if he had gone under the water, he still would have been taken by the effects of the large wave. The wave crashed into the docks and Zabuza managed to latch himself onto one of the wooden piers holding up the docks. Underwater, he watched as many of the other piers gave way under the power of the wave but his post held and he wasn't washed away across the harbor. A few moments later the water subsided, leaving a good portion of that area of the docks destroyed. Bruised but not too badly harmed Zabuza moved out of that part of the docks as he dodged the falling timber from the still collapsing sections. His fog had lifted as it started dissipating when he used the water prison technique. The brat's gone. He thought but experience told him differently. The large water technique must have been a distraction to hide and perhaps even lower his guard by making him think his opponent had left the area. The water was still agitated from the technique and Zabuza's hearing was unable to find any sound of the boy he had been fighting. Looking down below, he sent some chakra into the water to see if anything was down there. It was similar to using sonar but he didn't find the brat swimming underneath him. I know you're still here. Stated Zabuza to his surroundings but the sound of the choppy waves was the only response. In an instant Zabuza swung behind himself with the flat side of his blade and was rewarded with a thud and the weight of striking someone. Naruto grunted in pain and was thrown back by the hit. He tumbled and then skidded to a stop on the surface of the water near the collapsed area of docks. Naruto used a brief medical jutsu underneath his cloak on his arm and side of his chest to see what was wrong. He didn't have the chakra control to treat the problem but he could still use the basic medical ninjutsu. The diagnosis was that his arm was broken and his ribs were bruised. If he had been struck any higher on his body with the flat side of the blade, then he might have been knocked unconscious with that hit. Naruto tried not to let the pain get to him or show that he was injured to his opponent, but he could instantly tell that Zabuza already knew how injured he was. I guess this isn't the first time he's bludgeoned someone with his sword. Zabuza smiled and chuckled at his opponent. For a young brat, the kid had some amazing skill and training. His swordsmanship was excellent, and his jutsu was certainly more advanced than nearly anyone else in his age group would be. This had been the best fight he had in a while and much more interesting than fighting Hunter Neen from Kiri. 
He thought about stopping the fight as it wasn't often he came across someone of this skill and at such a young age, but a part of him wanted to see how the brat would fight with an injury. The cloaked brat didn't seem like the type to just run away. With one arm gone, both fighters knew that Naruto was at a greater disadvantage as he had only been able to stand up to Zabuza with both hands on his sword when he was fighting. Zabuza decided to take the fight to his injured opponent and charged. Naruto knew he didn't have time to go through hand seals with his broken arm. Zabuza was not that injured from the ninjutsu he used, but was noticeably slower in his charge. Preparing for the attack, Naruto grit his teeth and put his sword up in a defensive stance of Naiman but noticed again that the blade was sparking with electricity but more than before. It's as if it's telling me something, he thought. Zabuza was soon on top of him, and Naruto braced himself with the force and chakra to withstand whatever attack but something happened which he hadn't counted on. His sword reacted and released two arcs of lightning that struck Zabuza in the chest. The missing Nin was pushed back a good distance from Naruto, and the effect was likely compounded by the fact that Zabuza was still wet from Naruto's ninjutsu. Naruto stared at the effect and his sword as Zabuza cursed and got up from the attack. I didn't use lightning nature chakra which means that was force lightning. But I don't know how to use force lightning, he thought and he searched his feelings for an answer. He hadn't channeled lightning through the sword or used force lightning, the sword itself had produced the force lightning. It made sense as this was the first time he had used the sword in an extended battle, and he really didn't know what all it could or could not do. Unfortunately he didn't have time to further examine the situation as Zabuza was now up and looking rather pissed as well as smoking and singed from the lightning. Instead of attacking with his sword again, Zabuza started quickly going through hand seals and Naruto put his sword handle in his mouth again while trying to produce seals with his broken arm. He managed to get the seals created but he was much slower than Zabuza. Interestingly enough, both produced the same technique at nearly the same time and Zabuza was surprised because Naruto had used far fewer seals and yet had managed the same water dragon technique. Zabuza noted that Naruto's dragon was also bigger and was surprised a second time when it managed to push back his water dragon. Dodging, Zabuza got out of the way of the striking water dragon but it coiled and lashed out striking Zabuza and sending him into the destroyed docks. Naruto let go of the sword handle in his mouth caught it with the hand of his good arm, and charged toward his downed foe. This would likely be the end of the battle, and he could go back to his master before heading back to Kanoha. Naruto was nearly at the down Zabuza when he felt an attack coming and tried to dodge. He was unable to dodge it completely though and several Saban pierced his body. Three in his leg and two in his broken arm. He grimaced at the pain and remembered the hunter Nin that was traveling with Zabuza. Evidently his water clone had been destroyed and now he stood facing the new ninja. His arm was more useless than it had been as now he was having trouble bending it and knew from looking at the location of the Saban that it would be useless unless he removed them and waited for it to heal. I won't be able to use ninjutsu now, I'll just have to rely on the force then, he thought and studied his new opponent. Instead of fighting, the hunter Nin went and helped Sabuza up while keeping his or her eyes on him. Naruto thought the fight would continue but a voice stopped the fight. You might as well stop. I've seen what you can do Zabuza, there is no reason to go any further. Stated Gata from the top of the undamaged area of the docks. Furthering the fight would only destroy more of my docks. Come, we have much to discuss and you can leave. Stated Gata while looking at Naruto and secretly giving him instructions through their mental connection. Gato walked off and was followed by the two Kiri missing Nin. Zabuza was being supported by the other ninja. Play guys had successfully possessed Gato and given Naruto the instructions on what to do before leaving. He had been told to go back to Konoha and given instructions to build something. Naruto smiled slightly as the impromptu plan had been a success but he was disappointed that the fight had ended. Even against a fresh opponent he thought he still might have had a chance to win. Pulling out the Saban. He then sealed his sword into the storage seal on the working arm. Naruto had one task to do before heading back to Fire Country as he was still working with a limited time period to complete this mission and needed to get back to the village before he was discovered missing. Before leaving Wave, he went to one of the many warehouses that had been built in the new docking area. His master told him where it was and what to look for inside it. 
It wouldn't take long as he only needed a few of the items inside so he pulled out an empty storage scroll. Back at Gata's mansion. Any chance you can inform us what's going on? Otherwise I might just leave. Threatened and aggravated Zabuza as he didn't like being in the dark about something. Gata seemed perfectly fine for a man that was likely about to be killed by an assassin and Zabuza wanted to know what was going on and who the brat he just fought was and if he worked for Gatu. That was simply a test. Ninja are so hard to trust that I had to know you wouldn't back out of the deal or try to take advantage of the situation. It was also to test your skills. Rumors about strength and prowess in battle tend to get exaggerated and I wanted to make sure you're as good as I've been told. Stated Gatu while walking down the hall of his mansion to his study. He didn't seem phased by Zabuza's anger or killing intent at all or was good at not showing it. So you pitted me against someone just to test me. What would have happened if I killed the little brat? Inquired Zabuza and he received a curt answer from Gatu, then I wouldn't have had to pay him. Zabuza frowned slightly and he wanted to know more about the cloaked kid that was apparently on Gatu's payroll. Before he could say anything Gatu said, we can discuss your employment later. Dinner is at six in the dining room. It would be best for you to come. You can stay in any room in the south wing. And with that Gata entered his study and shut the door behind him leaving both Zabuza and Haku standing there. Looking at the door, Zabuza narrowed his eyes but left with Haku to find a room. Gata wasn't exactly how he heard him mentioned, which was a greedy and cowardly bastard. The short man seemed very calculating and manipulative. There would be time to get more answers later, and he intended to find out more about his new employer and the boy that worked for him. Playguys entered his study and looked into the mirror on the wall. His frown turned to disgust at the reflection that looked back at him. This body was nothing like his original. His mune body was tall, long-limbed, and graceful while this body he was possessing was short, stubby, and unbalanced. The features reminded him of an Ugnaught which was a pig-like humanoid, and the thought made him cringe slightly. Going to his new desk, he started getting his papers and files in order. He didn't have time to look at anything earlier, as he wanted to make sure his students survived the encounter with the two ninja. He knew that Naruto would likely fight and not try to get away as it had been some time since the boy had a battle. Playguys had arrived just in time to see Naruto's sword discharge force lightning. It was disappointing that he had missed most of the battle due to the body of Gata having such stubby legs and being so out of shape. However, seeing the sword's ability more than made up for it. The ability he witnessed was one that he had heard of which could be associated with Sith swords. During a battle, the sword would absorb the energy and conflict which caused it to build up a charge that could be released as force lightning. Playguys had been wondering for some time if the sword possessed any ability beyond what he already knew about it. Naruto had yet to show any ability in force lightning so it was a valuable power for the sword to have. Getting up and browsing through the nearby filing cabinets, Playguys looked for all of the information on Gata's business and holdings. He had access to the man's memory but Gata didn't remember everything and Playguys was filling in the gaps and looking through the company records, holdings, and accounts. His student's idea to possess Gata was much better than just using mind control although Playguys was still less than thrilled with the body. With control of the entire business, Playguys could gather, build, or create all that they would need to further their plans. He could also look into other interests that he had with Gata's money. In short, he could now accomplish all of his secondary goals that he had come up with that didn't involve his student. Before that, the main task he had to accomplish now was to set up communications with his student. Unfortunately, Communicating with Naruto from Wave to Konoha was too far for him using their connection and telepathy. Usually distance didn't matter with the Force but that didn't account for his limited abilities as a spirit since, without a body that possessed midichlorians, his Force power diminished greatly the farther a person was away from his spirit or holocron. Possessing a body allowed him to separate from his holocron but even then his Force ability diminished the farther he got from his holocron in his new body. This meant that he needed an alternative way to communicate with Naruto, and had come up with just the method while heading to the docks earlier. Finding the correct papers in the drawers of his desk, Playguys pulled them out and started looking through them. He needed to familiarize himself with the operations of his new company as well as connections with the world of crime. Looking over to his desk, 
he frowned at the placement of his holocron. The device was sitting on top of his desk where he had left it earlier, and though he was loath to admit it, the metal pyramid made an excellent paper weight and was more inconspicuous that way. He frowned slightly at the thought and the fact that Naruto had to return to Konoha before someone noticed he was missing. He would need his student to place a storage seal on his new body the next time he visited Wave, and then seal the holocron into it. In the meantime, he would leave it on the desk as it was less noticeable there. It would look strange for Gato to carry around the metal object with him wherever he went so he would not stray too far from the mansion or the holocron on his desk. Fortunately, he had recently acquired a large group of pawns and even with limited force ability, he could get them to do anything he required. Back in Konoha, two days later, Naruto sat in the hideout behind the Hokage faces and unsealed the scroll he filled while in wave country. When the smoke dissipated, several devices and piece of technology were revealed. Naruto had taken a radio, computer, camera, television and a few other things that he would need. He was currently in his workshop area of the hideout where he kept his tools and pieces of technology from the ship as well as items that he had found on the planet. He already procured a good-sized satellite dish at an earlier point, and now he could use it in something. Getting his tools out, Naruto started disassembling the larger pieces he had taken from the warehouse, which had been full of crates to ship to different parts of the elemental nations. Naruto started meditating while he went through the boring tasks of taking everything apart. He removed the outer casings of the larger hardware, and then took everything apart piece by piece. It took a little while but he used that time to think about what had happened since Wave Country. His arm was healed, and he had regained full use of it. Earlier he had examined both his memories and his sword to figure out what happened. He couldn't use Force Lightning with it whenever he wanted, and he assumed it had to do with the fighting with Zabuza as that was the most he had ever fought at one time with his sword. It had also been two days without any contact from his master. That was the reason he was in such a rush to disassemble the pieces before him and create a communications device to contact his master. He believed that in Wave Country, his master was likely building a very similar device. Naruto once thought that he was alone in village. He only had a few people such as the Hokage and the Ichirakas to talk to and even then it was limited as he couldn't spend all day with them. When he met his master, things had changed. It was true that he no longer talked with the Hokage very much or the Ichirakas, but he always had his master with him or close by. Despite losing people to talk or be near, he had a single person that he was even more close to and that offered him more than he could ever imagine. Since the time he first discovered the ship, his ties with the village had been all but severed. It didn't really faze him which it probably should have since he used to dream of being the Hokage. However, when compared to the thought of seeing a galaxy he once knew nothing about, the title of Hokage seemed trivial at best. Playguys knew everything about him and was always there when he needed help or guidance. He also told him everything that Naruto had wanted to know, and which no one else wanted to tell him. That he was aware of, Master Playguys had never lied to him, which was more than he could say for the rest of the village. Thus he had never been truly alone, that is, until now. His master was miles away and they hadn't been in contact for several days. Now he was completely alone for the first time in his life. Even when the villagers hated him and looked at him like they did, it didn't compare to the crushing loneliness that he had always felt. That had gone away when his master found him. No, it didn't go away completely. It got pushed aside but it was still there and now it's back thought Naruto as he let his hands remove the last components from the computer and start on the television. In the past few years he had a lot to deal with. The stolen items that he kept hidden, not making a mistake or getting caught while furthering their plans, and living a secret life known by no one but his master. Through it all, Playguys was always there for him. His master had taught him so many different things and needed his help. No one else in the village really needed him or wanted his help and for that, Naruto was grateful. Even if he was being used to help further his master's plans, someone was finally paying complete attention to him and didn't care about the QB. The village didn't need him or want him and never stopped giving him those looks. Naruto had never been truly able to control all his emotions or feelings, he just put on a mask and hid everything. He was the student of a Sith Lord and he himself was a Sith so he should act like one. 
His master was counting on him, and he finished disassembling everything. Examining all of the parts that he had, Naruto started work on putting together a makeshift communication device. He would use a small power generator that was on the ship to power the device. Normally the generator was used to charge up power cells or other items, but it would more than serve his purpose. The stress and loneliness seemed magnified now that he was alone. His master had been training him for this by giving him numerous choices and letting him make his own decisions but Naruto hated the loneliness. Just sitting alone in the hideout was starting to get to him, and he dove back into his work. He had most of the device assembled and was putting on the camera and attaching the monitor so that they could see and talk with each other. Naruto would use the satellite dish to amplify the signal, and he had to make sure that the village wouldn't be able to pick it up. He idly wondered if he should find others or at least someone else to talk to now that his master was gone. He had given up several chances to form new bonds with people in the village most of which were at the academy. There were people all around him when he was in the village, but he didn't want anything to do with most of them. It was hard considering what he had done in the village. He heard people couldn't be friends if they kept secrets from each other. Ironically, the closest people he had to friends were his two genin teammates, and they were spies for another village. It was a sad thought but completely true. Perhaps I can find people in the galaxy. It's so big. I doubt I would be alone forever. Now that I think about it, perhaps I can still find people like that here. He thought. It was just him and his master right now, but would it always remain that way? Eventually he would leave the village and perhaps people outside of Kanoha and Fire Country would be different, and he could make friends. The thought brought a sad smile to his face. It was at that point that he finished connecting all of the wires and turned on the generator. The screen flickered and he adjusted the dish and the signal to be the same as the one his master was using. He wasn't sure how long it would take for Playguys to create a similar device in Wave Country. Naruto pushed down all of his useless emotions inside himself that he had started letting loose while working on the device. He pushed them so far down that his master probably couldn't feel them and perhaps he himself couldn't feel them either. Naruto, like he had been training to do, used emotions when he needed them and he had been learning to wield them along with the dark side of the force to great effect. There was no need for many of the emotions that he still had though, but he did still have them so he merely hid them as best as he could considering that didn't seem capable of getting rid of them entirely. It was a weakness that could be exploited by an enemy that was adept with the force which was why he hid them. Once he was done, his features became an emotionless mask and his eyes looked alert, cold, and uncaring. He would only need to wait for his master's transmission, and he wouldn't be alone anymore. He had a feeling his master had much to tell him, and there would likely be updates to their plans and further planning to be done. Naruto idly wondered if his master had seen his fight, and if he was proud or thought Naruto did well against such a foe. Pushing those thoughts aside, he started working on the plans for his new weapons and wondered when he would get the chance to make them considering what happened the last time he used a furnace in the village. He also had the plans for the fusion reactor for the ship nearby. Lists of all the parts and materials they would need as well as machinery were nearby as well, but he still didn't know where they would start working on the reactor. Wave Country didn't seem like a very secure or safe place. It was isolated, which was something they needed, but it was so close to Kanoha that even a single ninja mission to that country could get them discovered. The place looked rather destitute when Naruto was there. He could feel the sadness of the people that he passed while getting information on Gata's whereabouts, and it was not a place he wanted to return to. He still had some trouble keeping out the thoughts and emotions of others when he was in a crowded area where strong emotions were present. Naruto looked around at the hideout and thought that he might miss the rocky lair that he had helped discover, expand, and fortify. 